Um, my name is Jane Guberman. Today is Tuesday, February 14th, 2017, and I'm here with Michael Paley at his home in New York City. And we're going to record an interview for the Jewish Counterculture Oral History Project. Michael, do I have your permission to record this interview? Indeed. As you know, today we're going to explore your experiences during the late 60s and early 70s, and particularly your experiences in connection with Chavarat Shalom, and also the impact that Chavarat has had on your own life and on the Jewish world and beyond. I'd like to start by talking about your personal and family background and to flesh out a bit who you were at the time that you got involved with the Chavarat. Let's begin with your family when you were growing up. So you were born in 1952 in Boston? In Brooklyn. In Brooklyn. So tell us a little Chestnut bit about... Chestnut Hill, in fact. Chestnut Hill. You were born in a hospital? I was born at the uh, Children's uh, Hospital, and then uh, right back to Chestnut Hill. Named Haskett, actually. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about your family, about your parents and your, and your family when you were growing up. Um, uh, I had, by all accounts, um, a wonderful, uh, supportive, and cultured family growing up. Um, we lived on a beautiful, leafy suburban street, and all of the kids on the street, um, um, many of whom I still know, turned out to be extraordinarily high-achieving uh, people. This is in Chestnut Hill? In Chestnut Hill. I went to the Baker School. It was, I think, I don't know the real numbers, it felt 98% Jewish. Only Martha O'Brien and Timothy Stewart were non-Jews in my entire three separate grade baby boomer you know, uh, 50s class. Um, of course, nothing Jewish about going to the Baker School except only Jews. Um, uh, I went, we, we were belonged to Mishkin Tefillah, um, uh, Temple Mishkin Tefillah. Tell me about your parents first though. So my, my father was from Lowell. Um, his parents were immigrants. He had a sparkle in his eye and whenever he came in the room, everything felt better from his, his whole life. Um, he was an incredible Jewish activist. So he was not learned, he used to make fun of me studying, but he was um, a committed member of the combined Jewish philanthropies of Boston. He was on committees. He was, there was no place too far for him to go to to make a little fundraising speech. There was no crowd too small for him to walk through the snow. Pretty any much of those on things. behalf of CJP? On behalf of CJP and behalf of the Jewish community. It was the 50s, um, and there was a lot to get done in the post-Holocaust years, and he was very much involved with that. You know, was he involved he was, in Zionist activism? activism? In 1956, he went to Israel. Um, uh, I was four years old, but I remember. Um, uh, and um, he went with a guy named Herb Friedman, um, who would later play a role in my own life. Um, but from that time, he was part of what was going to become the first young leadership cabinet, um, and they went to go meet Ben Gurion, um, who was going to swim on the beach. And he took a 16 millimeter film of it, which we saw hundreds of times um, of Ben Gurion. And at a certain moment, Ben Gurion stands on his head, which I la later found out was part of the Feldenkrais method. Um, and and so my father was smitten by Israel in the middle 50s when Israel was just nothing, you know? It was just struggling and just, you know, to... But symbolically incredibly important. Very important. And then he never really engaged himself in shul again um, because I once asked him, I said, I thought you'd be the president of synagogue. He said, no, no, one meeting with Ben-Gurion is worth like thousands of times of going to shul. It was like so exciting to him and he was so not just a lifelong Zionist, but an incredible supporter, fundraiser, and cultivator of Israel. I think he went to Israel 70 times in his life. My brother moved there, and so his grandchildren lived there. But even before my brother moved there, you know, he was a real traveler. Um, JDC boards, he was the president of New England Highest. He was a real um, uh, uh, community-engaged Jewish leader. What about your mother, though? So my mother um, was a bird watcher and garden club, United Way, nothing Jewish, nothing Jewish really. Um, she became um, head of the Young Women's Division at CJP and she even started a Jewish education program and at the end of her life she took the Maya program um, in Boston and she called me once and she said, you know Michael, Judaism, it's unusually interesting, which I thought was 
I said, oh yes, and she said, and by the way, Michael, a lot of the books we read in our classes were written by your friends. I said, oh, thank you, that's right. <laughs> I, I knew so, that. So, so what the Mayo program is? Uh, the Mayo program is, uh, I think it's based on 100 hours of Jewish education. Um, it was modeled after the Wexner Heritage Foundation, which is, was I worked for for some time. Um, and it was Jewish education classes, in her case at the Hebrew College, with a raft of very fine teachers. And for it was adults. For adults. For, and she was in her 70s. And it was the first time that she'd ever really studied Judaism except for the activist parts. But she was on the JDC board also, on the board, really, being mentored by these people. She traveled around the world to go to JDC meetings. Very active, but very anti-religious. My mother was anti-religious. My mother's great-grandfather came to America in 1830, moved to Cincinnati from, from, from uh, Alsace-Lorraine, from near Strasbourg. Um, they were anti-religious then, they were anti-religious at the very end of her life. My grandmother, um, her, my mother's mother, um, whom I was not so close to, but was very engaged with, um, unlike my grandfather, um, who was a Lithuanian, uh, 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 used to tell me how disappointingly ethnic I looked. Michael, you look so Jewish. I mean, why? What's with the Jewish? But this is America. We can get rid of the Jewish. I mean, she was a real... My grandmother was, was really an assimilationist in some kind of serious way. Um, and, like, I want to tell you she was part of the reform movement of Cincinnati, but she wasn't really. She was an assimilated American Jew who all of a sudden had gotten sucked into this large... Clan. So, what was the Jewish environment like in your home when you were growing up? So, um, my father said Kiddush on Friday nights, um, uh, uh, but even as I awoke as a Jew when I was eight or nine years old, so it was quite early, I started to walk to the synagogue, sometimes myself, when I was nine and ten and eleven years old. They wouldn't go with me. You know, they, they would just. It was just a, a, a vapid, Torahless, Jewish, suburban environment, which produced a fantastic number of highly engaged, highly literate, and, and, and highly um, active Jewish leaders in the 21st century. Go figure. Can I? It's hard to understand. Really hard to understand. My, my friend growing up, my closest friend growing up, was a guy named John Shapiro. Um, uh, and John Shapiro was the waspiest kid we'd ever met. We didn't even know he was Jewish, I think. Shapiro, was a it should have been a tip-off, but really, he went to Hava Shalom in, in Brookline, Reform. Reform was like, not even Temple Israel. It was like totally off the... I mean, high Reform, it was high Reform. I, I, I went to his Bar Mitzvah. I, 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 didn't know, no, I didn't recognize it as a Bar Mitzvah or a service. I just had never seen anything like it. So, you know... And yet, John Shapiro became the president and president of UJ Federation of New York, and now he's the president of the American Jewish Committee, the lay president. So, how did that happen? I don't know. Yeah. Stephen Perlstein, he never went to shul or anything else like that. They were just I don't know. They owned Louis of Boston. They were like in the their Jewish identity was the clothing business, um, and yet he won the Pulitzer Prize and he writes on Israel and he's highly literate and I I, I don't know. Joey Banner, up the street, little, little runty kid, you know. He became the president of the Philadelphia Eagles and now this Cleveland Browns and he's like a big, big wheel in the Jewish Federation world. And like that. I don't know, it was, a, it was a kind of a totally Jewish environment. Um, and but devoid of religion. Devoid of religion. No, more than devoid of religion, anti-religion. Religion was the, the, it was the Jewish identity that we rejected. Um, and my mother was certainly part of that. Um, uh, the more religious I became, the more she feared I would be lost, right? To her and, and maybe permanently. I, it was a cult. My mother always thought of Judaism as a cult, and it was coming to get me. I mean, even benign Jewish life. You mentioned that your family belonged to Temple Michigan to Philip. Yeah. Um, which was the oldest conservative synagogue in New England. That's right. So what are your early memories of Michigan and Philip and, and your involvement there too as a child? My father was um, my father was on the building committee 
Um, that was the history of his family. My my father the came from. Where they were moving to Chestnut Hill. That's right. So he was he was he was one of the instigators of moving from Seaver Street and Roxbury to Chestnut Hill. Um, my father had come from a long line of people that were either the treasurers of the Jewish community or on the building committee, so they could build synagogues, so they then would not have to go to them. Um, uh, my grandfather, his father, who who was an immigrant but lived in Lowell, had built the. Um, synagogue in Lowell, but then didn't go to it. Thought it was s silly, you know, it was in America. We don't have to go to shul anymore. Um, I think my father loved going to shul when he went. Um, when my grandfather um, suddenly died when I was eight years old, my father went to shul every morning, and I would go with him. And he loved to lead the davening, he had a beautiful bass voice and things like that. But as soon as my grandfather, you know, the same Kaddish was done, he was done. I think my mother uh, resented that he did that. You know, in the morning, my father would get up early and go to shul and sometimes take me, but she was left with the other kids. And, you know, I think she just resented it. My what mother often didn't go to Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. What was it like for you going to shul with your father when you were saying Oh, I loved it. I loved it. I love shul. I always love shul. Um, uh, I used to walk from our house through the back way and near the Brookline incinerator, you know, it was really beautiful, romantic um, walk for a 10-year-old, you know, in the 50s, now early 60s. Um, uh, and I would go to junior congregation and I loved the whole thing. I liked the singing, I liked the, I liked the girls, I liked the, the, the chopped liver, I, I liked everything about it, really, that's the fact. Um, uh, and my parents just fought me about that. And then the rabbi, Rabbi Kazis, would drive me back home at the end of shul. You know, so I'd walk there, but he would drive me back home. So that was like hard to understand. The end of Shabbat, you mean? End of, no, the end of the service, during the Shabbat. The service. Yeah. He would drive you back home? Yeah. It was, it was the 50s. We didn't, we didn't know anything. So, um, uh, so, so Mishka de Filler was just a terrible synagogue in almost every way. It was, it was, the services were boring and they were, I loved it, but, there's nothing else. But it was conservative, and I learned some things, and I loved the Olenu because I liked the fact that it was set to the lilting tune of the farmer in the dell. You know, like, I don't know. It, for some reason, it, it, the whole thing worked for me, and I was quite dedicated to going. The great thing about Michigan Phil was that intellectually, it was among the finest synagogues in the, in the country. And so... In terms of your education, you're talking about. In terms so of what, what was your education, your Jewish education? Well, as a child? when I was a when I was a kid, I went to Hebrew school. I learned absolutely nothing. Um, it was mostly in the fifties. Um, uh, the wives of Israeli graduate students um, who held us in very low esteem. You know. Why did your parents send you? Or was it that you wanted to? Everybody went. That's all, what we all did. The kids Every, all kids in my neighborhood went, and and that's what you did, and. Although I don't know why, it's a, it's a harder question. I think about it sometimes. Because my aunt, my mother's older sister, did not send her kids to Hebrew school or anything else and hoped that they would marry non-Jews. And my oldest cousin did. Um, uh, and then finally my youngest, my younger cousin, my age also, finally did. But she was committed to the Jewish thing. But there's another story in all this, if I might, which is that my grandfather... My mother's father was one of um, 13 children. And so, and many of them lived in my street. So we grew up in a clan, and the clan was Jewish. And it just had a Jewish feel to it, so. What do you mean by he, that? It, it, was, it was, we were the Jews, you know, and my great, my, my great grandparents were, you know, had moved from the, um, uh, the north end of Boston to Malden, you know, and, and it, was just, it just, was just filled with some kind of distilled American Judaism that was hard to say what it was, but it was quite surrounding. Sounds like it was palpable. 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 Delightful. Really, for me, delightful. It, you know, it, it, was, it was supportive and enthusiastic, and there were a lot of us. Not terribly demanding. It was demanding in the terms of, of uh, personal relations, not in terms of anything else. Nothing. But it was a clan, you know, so in terms of a sense of Eastern European shtetl, I grew up in the clan, you know, I grew up in the, in the American 
edition of the shtetl, which was the Cohen family. And we had Hanukkah parties and seders together. Like 200 people came to our seder. They were all my cousins. You know, we did skits and you know, all these kind of things. So it was really quite, it was very Jewish, you know, even though it's no content that you could have really pointed to. And in Hebrew school and Sunday school, did you learn anything that has stuck, stuck with you? I, I remember when I was eight years old, um, uh, there was a, um, the cantor at Michigan Philly, his name was Gregor Shulkan. Um, uh, lovely man, he used to sing in a falsetto voice sometimes, as it was this custom in Europe. Nothing could have been more humorous for young children than a man getting up and singing in a falsetto voice, you know, which was very moving probably, but we thought that was just, couldn't believe that. So, um, uh, and then they did a, a TV program called This Is Your Life, um, and he was on This Is Your Life, you know, so they brought us all into an assembly in the, in the social hall at Michigan Villa, um, and with a big screen, I think it was like a sheet, you know, they were gonna project with like some fancy technology from the 50s. Um, and we watched the show, This Is Your Life, and This Is Your Life is about Gregor Shalkan's surviving the Holocaust. So they had pictures of the Holocaust, and they had his sisters who had tattoos on their arm, and then he showed us his tattoo, and then he brought in his Holocaust jacket, his striped jacket with a what and I remember going home to my mother and saying, do you know about this? You know, I was, I was eight years old, like what were they thinking? What was the educational mission of, that's how I found out about the Holocaust, was that Gregor Shulkin was on This Is Your Life. Really, if, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was like 1959, 1960, like that. I talked to my friend Joel Cases, who I, I grew up with, he, same thing, that's when he learned about the Holocaust. We were of in tears. What did your mother say? She said, yeah, I know about it, it's really terrible. She tried to mitigate it, but it was searing. It was a, sh a life-shaping experience for me, you know? And I mean, you know, and then I think he got a washing machine because he was on the show. I mean, I think he got presents or gifts for being on the show, This Is Your Life, and he got to see his sisters who had, were in Israel. He hadn't seen them for like 10 years. The whole thing was horrendous. So if I think about my entire Hebrew school experience, that was the searing moment of it. It really was. It, I can, I, I, the images, because the TV then was black and white. I can remember black and white Holocaust. Amazing, right? Yeah. I mean, you have to think that Judaism in the 1950s in the suburbs was just as, it was just stupid in every way. What about your bar mitzvah? So I, I, one of the critical um, aspects of my life is that I had a really sad learning disability. I had it then, I have it now. Um, uh, so it was very hard for me to learn how to read either in Hebrew or in English. Um, uh, so thankfully my bar mitzvah was in the parsha which I now know is called Kitetze. Um, um, and it has the shortest haftarah. So, so, I, I, and I only had to do half of it because Michael Tickner, who is now the president of the New England region of the conservative movement or something like that, and his father became like the national president of the United Synagogue. Um, he was my bar mitzvah partner, so I did half and he did half. Um, and uh, we had three rabbis speak, Mayor, uh, uh, Rabinowitz, who was the old rabbi, knew my grandparents. My grandparents were wealthy, so you know, everybody had to kiss up to them in some ways. Um, and, um, and we played Sounds of Silence at my bar mitzvah party. Um, uh, the most important moment of my bar mitzvah, which, I, which has a significant impact on my life, um, is that I was awakening. I was a very involved Jewish kid, right? I was going to shul on Shabbos morning. So I go to Rabbi Kazis, who really was a lovely man. He was a student of Hasidism. He was a graduate student of Harry Strin Wolfson, serious intellectual, um, but I think just hated being a rabbi in the suburbs. That's my thought, it may not be true. Um, uh, so I went to meet with him before my bar mitzvah because I requested it. Otherwise, kids didn't meet with him. And I said, well, what's my portion about? And he said, you know, Michael, it's not really one of the important ones. <laughs> so I said, what do you mean it's not one of the important ones? Like, you know, uh, um, it's my bar mitzvah. So I, I learned nothing. We didn't get to give it to our Torah. It was the 50s, you know, now 60s. I, my, my bar mitzvah was on September 11th. So 
becomes a day that lives in infamy. Um, and I got to say nothing. I got to say um, by memory the first five sukim. One other little thing is I, I have a very con strong connection to Hungary and live there, um, but I have a really funny Hebrew accent. Um, and one of the reasons for that is that Michael Domba, who was the shamus and taught you how to do the Haftarah, was Hungarian. So only a few years ago, when I went to Hungary and I started to speak Hebrew to the people in Hungary, which I now speak Hebrew, um, I realized that he was Hungarian, and that's why I talked that way. <laughs> so my early Hebrew was with a Hungarian accent. What does that mean? What's an example? Um, uh, uh, it's all Ashkenazi, right? So it's... So your bar mitzvah was Ashkenazi? Accent. Ashkenazi, Ashkenazis, right? Ashkenazis with a Hungarian accent. Like that. Long that Hungarian. 65? Five. We had lots of Hungarians in the community because they came in 56 and 57 after the Hungarian Revolution. I would say that if I'm known for anything in the Jewish community is that every Shabbos I start off the Devar Torah with this as it happens is my favorite Parsha. And I believe that every Shabbos, and I do it primarily because Rabbi Kays has told me that my Parsha wasn't that important. So every Parsha is important, and by the time Wednesday rolls around, every Parsha is my favorite Parsha. Did you ever get to talk to him about it later? I didn't get to talk about that, I don't think, because I, I didn't think about it until a bit later. But I did get to talk to him when he was old. Um, uh, his son, Richard Cases, was my friend. Um, and so I, get, I, I think I went to visit him in Israel, and it was a real, he was wonderful, but he did something remarkable, Rabbi Kezis. So, so Mishkan Phil was a very intellectually stimulating place. When you were 9 or 10 or 11, that went over your head. It didn't matter that it was intellectually stimulating. But by 14, 15, 16, 17, he put together the finest, um, a Hebrew high school program, I'm sure maybe the world has ever known. I mean, Buzzy Fishbane taught on it, and Larry Silberstein, and, and Yaronis Rachi, and Sidrez Rachi, and Eric Myers, and, and Carol Myers, and Jeremy Zwelling, and Cal Bland, and then later Richie Siegel, and George Saverin. I mean, you know, and, and Art came, Art Green came to give talks there, and it was, it was, you, you kind of couldn't go back to high school after the Hebrew high school because the Hebrew high school was so stimulating. I think I said in, this, in the interview there, the, you know, the, we, I took a class from Sidra Ezrahi on American Jewish literature. So it's kind of a boring class, right? What would that be about? So what do we read? Bellows, Mr. Samuel's Planet, and Philip Roth's Portnoy's Complaint, and, uh, and Bernard Melman's The Natural, and I mean, Henry Roth's College Sleep. This is in high school. This is, you know, after high school. It, I mean, you couldn't sit still. I mean, Isaac Bishop was singing. We read The Slave, I remember, of Isaac Bishop was singing, which is filled with sexual fantasy and things like that. I said, whoa, <laughs> you know, whoa, like I, you know, I, I, I couldn't sleep, you know, from after the things I was. And then, and then, and then Larry Silberstein, who later went on, was, I, I worked for him at Akiva, taught us Boober and I and Thou. And, and you no, know, that, Prime me for the Chavara, you know, I mean, it was about relationship. It was texts were about relationship. All life is meeting. I mean, I, like, I tried to memorize I Am Thou by the time I was 15. That was like amazing. And then we learned about Rosenzweig and Glotzer from Brandeis came in. We were high school kids to give us a talk on, on Rosenzweig and his relationship with Rosenzweig. Oh my God. I mean, you, we had tears in our eyes. It was, it was, it was, remarkable. It was remarkable. I mean, you, you couldn't wait to go. Patty Saris, who's a federal judge in Boston, um, uh, uh, once said to me, she went to Harvard and Harvard Law School, and you know, she was every intellectual. She said the most intellectual experience of her life was Michigan and Philly Hebrew High School. It was just, I mean, Carol Myers was teaching us Genesis. We had learned Genesis like 5,000 times as kids. It was, nothing could be more boring than Genesis. And she started talking about Eve as a feminist tale and the rejection of women and I said, whoa, <laughs> this, is, this is different. You know, uh, she said, you know, chapter six of Genesis, the daughters of men and the, you know, you know, being impregnated by the godlings. I said, whoa, I had missed that one. You know, like, I, what was that? You know, and we only learned about the women in the book of Genesis. And we did learn about the men. And we learned about silence and voices. 
you know, that was like revolutionary in my head. It was so exciting. You know, oh, it was a real awakening for you. Absolutely. It was, Brookline High School was just not like that at all. Huh. Meanwhile, Six Day War happened while you were in high school. Yes. What kind of an impact did that have on so, you and others? It had, a fin it had the greatest impact of any event of history in my life, without question. I'm sure I wouldn't be sitting here with you. Maybe neither of us would be here, but I surely would not be here without the Six Day War. Um, uh, uh, in 1966, I went on the UJA Bar Mitzvah pilgrimage to Israel. Um, uh, my parents were Zionists after all, so I got in a plane and a bunch of guys, you know, and, and women, and it was 1966, it was really amazing um, a trip, and it engaged me with Israel. Yeah, no, so um, how would you describe the impact of the war on you? What, how did you feel? So, so I knew Israel already. I'd been, you know. So to have a war in a place I had been was much different for, than kids that were just kind of learning about Israel. But the decisive impact of the Six Day War was that it was a victory, and there had been nothing positive about my Jewish identity until that moment. It was all post Holocaust, boring Hebrew schools, bad cooking. That turned out to be only my grandmother. Um, uh, I don't know, what was the good part of Judaism? There was nothing, nothing good about Judaism except that we were all Jews. Even, was, even though you'd been, well I guess this was early on, you hadn't quite hit the Hebrew high school yet. I hadn't right. hit the Hebrew high school, right, 67, I'm only 15. Right. So, so I'm just getting to it, but not, not yet really. Cause, but by the time the Six Day War happened... Yes, I am, I am awakening as a Jew. But I'm not talking personally here, I'm talking about historically. E even though I thought Judaism was now engaging and I like going to shul and things like that, what was Judaism in suburban Boston, in Chestnut Hill of all places? It was, it was, there was no content to it. it was, I was getting some content, but, but the environment of Judaism had no success in it. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, a miracle. All right, I can, I can, I can give you my demural on it now, but there's no doubt at 19, when at 15 years old that all of a sudden, whew, just, I remember Halloween in, in October of 1967, John Shapiro and I um, uh, dressed up as Moshe Diane. Right? We had some years earlier dressed up as Castro, so we had army fatigues and a, and a, and a cigar and a beard, so now we use army fatigues and a patch. Um, it was the first Jews we'd ever dressed up as. And Phil Brown. Yeah, we felt it was the Six Day War was just filled with miracle and pride, and and we were the winners. You know, we had come from the Holocaust, and there were Holocaust survivors on our street, and it was it was devastating. I mean, since the this is your life show of, of Gregor Shalkan, it, it that's my images of Judaism, and all of a sudden we were the winners. It was it was revolutionary, absolutely revolutionary. You know, and people were talking about Israel and talking about Jews, and Jews were now strong. And even, I went to Brookline High School during those years, you know, it was a totally Jewish existence for me in high school, but, but all of a sudden the, the conversations changed. You know, everything changed. Everything changed in the Six-Day War. Yes? These were also years of tremendous political activism in general, in society, the right counterculture, civil rights movement, etc. To what extent had you been really influenced by all of that and, yes. and involved? Tremendously. Tremendously involved with it. Civil rights because of my parents. Um, uh, my father was the head of the Temple Forum, which was a very fecund place for civil rights leaders like Martin Luther King and Thurgood Marshall and Megar Evers and James um, Meredith and all these people to come and fundraise. Um, and Kivi Kaplan came and all these people. They were all came and my father was the person that organized those. Um, and so Thurgood Marshall came to our house um, and we all met Megar Evers. Um, and I have pictures, you know, of, of those moments. And then Martin Luther King came to Michigan Phil and we all, and I went and saw him. So it was a really, um, so I'm young, I'm too young, I'm 63, 64, I'm 10, 11, 12 years old. But I'm watching my father and my, my identity is being formed by my parents' activism. They're not freedom riders, but they are 
very much engaged. They're, they're on the older side of that. Did they go to... That was their religion in some ways. That, I would say civil rights movement was their Jewish identity. And they did it with all other Jews. That was it. Did they go to some of the demonstrations? And they did. They did go to demonstrations, the, but they didn't go to the big ones. Not that I know of, at least. I, I don't remember. But because of the, of, the, of the money aspect of it, civil rights leaders came to us. I mean, my father, when Thurgood Marshall, you know, who was the head of the NAACP Civil, um, civil uh, Defense, the Legal Defense Fund, um, uh, when he, he came to our house, Thurgood Marshall, and my father underlined how important a deal that was. That was really significant in every way. So then when Vietnam came around, my father was for the war in Vietnam, um, kind of a John F. Kennedy, anti-communist, you know, cold warrior um, for the beginning of it, but I was totally radicalized by it, by, by, the, by the Vietnam War. So, so the Vietnam War comes just as I'm in later high school, and, and then... And by then, anti-war activism was ramping up. My friend, who's a Globe columnist now and, and a really a brilliant guy named Stephen Kinzer, um, uh, he and I started the underground newspaper at uh, Brooklyn High School called The Rapper. Um, and I become part of the counterculture, which is also the drug culture. You know, both of those things were true. So by 15, you know, in, in, when I'm 15, 67, the Vietnam War is all of a sudden becoming more and more in the news, and by 68, the summer of love, I'm, I'm the perfect age. Yeah. And because of your parents' activism, did you connect that with your Judaism, with your Jewish identity in any way at that point? There was no connection, right? There was no Jewish part of the anti-war movement, and there was no anti-war movement part of the Jewish existence. But in 1967, 1968, 1968, I think, Larry Silverstein, who was then the assistant rabbi at Michigan Tefillah and a graduate student at Brandeis, um, uh, gave a talk against the war um, at my cousin Lisa Miller's bat mitzvah. And her grandfather, who was a gold star, lost his leg in the war, and I don't know, maybe he didn't lose none in the war, whatever the story is, just, they, were, they went ballistic about that. And so the family, negative. Fam negative. And I went, I was euphoric that finally someone was mentioning the Vietnam War in shul. And, and so all of a sudden those two things came together. Um, and then my Jewish side and my activist side, you know, which had been totally separate, all of a sudden started to visit each other a little bit. And then in, in 69, I went to a draft resistance demonstration in the Chelsea Naval Yard. And I met Michael Brooks and Art Green and people that were all there. How did you happen to meet them? They had, they had, they had Talesimon, right? They were wearing, they were then and even now. Like I just noticed, you know, when I went to the demonstration where the rabbis got arrested against the last you know, week. Last week. Ago, and they all, all the rabbis that got arrested, all wore Talesim, you know, and I wore a Talis and. And in 1968, I just had never seen anybody wearing a talis at the demonstration before. And that's how I got myself invited to the Chavra. That was the... So you got in a conversation with Michael Brooks? Michael Brooks, basically. yes. And he said, why don't you come for dinner? He was... He, what was he, 21? Yeah, we were kids. We were all kids, but... But that was dramatic. What did he tell you about what he was inviting you to? Shabbos dinner, the Shabbos dinner. But he said, come first to the, we're going to have a davening. So I said, I didn't know what davening meant, but, but I said, you know, how about, what does a davening mean? He says, you know, we're going to pray. We're going to pray on Friday night, and then we'll have dinner. I said, cool, you know, like I was up for anything. You know, I was, I was like being a hippie. And so, you, you know, if they said, and we're going to drop acid after that, cool, you know, cool. Then we're going to throw, overthrow the government. Cool. I don't know, you know, like I was up for it. <laughs> so, so we go to the. I should. I, please do. Please tell the story. So you went so it's to, on Franklin Street, you know, in Cambridge. The very beginning of the Very beginning. Very beginning. I don't know when, what month it was, but very beginning. 
It started in September, I think. Of I know, but at least what month this was? February, shortly after. Well, shortly after, maybe. Mm -hmm. No, I think it was in the early, late winter. Okay. You know, February, something like that. Not right in the beginning. So sixty-nine, the very beginning. Of so 69. it might have been the beginning of sixty-nine. Yes, sounds right to me. Okay. So chronology is a little so hazy. You, you went. That makes sense to me because I'm a junior in high school. That's right. Right. Sixteen and a half. Sixteen. Sixteen and a half. So. Um, <laughs> We took ourselves so seriously, you know, I'm 16 and a half years old for crying out loud. So we go to the davening. And you and Michael? You me and, with right. And, and, and the people coming for dinner that night are Larry Lofman and, I mean, you know, all these chavara, I think Barry Holtz and, you know, I, for me, you know, I'm, I'm younger, but I'm not, but I'm precocious. Let's say that. Um, uh, and, uh, so we walk into the davening, and Zalman, first of all, it's in a, it's in a living room in a, an apartment in Cambridge, as opposed to Michigan to Philo. What does the room look like? Can it, you remember? I do. It's, a, it's an apartment, you know, so it, it, it has cushions on the floor, you know, and, um, and like a little table, and, and Zalman, I think, is wearing like a kapata, you know, like a long silk coat. I never, this is all, you know. Um, he, I think he was wearing strimal, but not all the time. And I think he has, has his kid on his knee. I mean, this is not Michigan Philip. I mean, this is through the looking glass, you know, this is, this is the Beatles. I mean, this is the Moody Blue, I don't know. So this is totally different experience of Jewish life. And he starts off with a nigan. So I, I, can I remember the room more than that? I, I can't, you know, it's, yeah. it's, I don't know, what is it, 50 years, you know. Had you ever experienced a nigun like that? No. no, no, never. I didn't know what a nigun was. Um, no, I only had junior congregation. I, I, I had done some chanting with Hare Krishna. So maybe I had experienced that, you know? And then there was a, a group called the Electric Prunes and they did masses, you know, rock masses. So I had gone to a place called the Damaged Angel on uh, Arlington Street, you know, so they, and they would do chanting there. So I knew something about chanting. I didn't know it existed in Judaism. And then Zalman just did this nigan, you know, for like an hour. An hour? Like an hour, like an hour. People joined in with him? Again, like an hour. And I think we had, you know, there was some amount of illegal drug use just before that, so the niggin and the drugs and sitting on the cushions and I mean this was low light I see. low light candles I think we had I can't remember I can't remember what the lighting was later on we had candelabra with with real candles it was it yeah. was was that was there a couple of about service or any kind of a service if I remember correctly I may have Put this in, so I, I I can't give a historical witness to this, but I remember going to Zalman this time or the next time or the time after. We he did it a number of times. I was starting to go all the time, um, and uh, saying, "How about the davening? <laughs> like how about the service?" And he said, "That this is the service." And I said, "Are we allowed to do that?" He said, "We're in charge." And that was a really important remark to me. We are in charge. We can do anything we want. Because my mother had assaulted my grandmother for eating lobster out and being kosher at home. Like, you know, it was black or white and, and, and religion was black and the rest of the Enlightenment world was white. And all of a sudden, we were in charge. We could do anything we want. We could fix it. We could make it spiritual. We could, we could, I don't know. We could was do anything. Was it spiritual? Had you ever oh. experienced anything like that? Oh. It was spiritual in the following way. So, so I had done Hare Krishna chanting that had had a lot of uh, impact on me. I had done some meditation. I'm 16 during that time. I'm like into religion. I want to know. I had gone to the Vedanta Center. So sort of uh, Eastern. Influence. Almost all Alan Watts, all Eastern, right? Nothing, 
nothing Western whatsoever. Islam for sure not. We didn't. We hadn't heard of Islam. Um, I think they were out there, but we just had never heard of them. Um, uh, and uh, and Mishkan Fila was not totally not spiritual. I mean, it was anything spiritual about it had been beaten out. Falsetto. That's probably the most spiritual part of it. You know. They don't do that. Yeah, we we thought it was. I don't know, he's sang, singing like a girl. I don't know, like the whole thing. We didn't have anything. We didn't know there were gays. We didn't, we didn't, it was the 60s. We didn't know. What did you feel in these services? This was 100% transporting. Transporting. If I thought that there was the realm of the I and thou, and I was trapped in the I, it, this was the opening of the door. I was transported right through, right up. I'd never been back since then. My whole life changed then and has never turned back. I have always been able to open the davening door. And since that time, since that day, Zalman, Zalman did something for me that I was just the great gift of my life. He opened the door to another realm of being. The, if there's a counterculture for me, it was the, uh, the next realm of being. It was friendship, it was slow. Remember, you know, in, in, in Michigan and Philly, they would, they would, you know, I I had dyslexia. I could not keep up. I could barely read Hebrew. I could barely read English. Now all of a sudden, Zama's going, you know, it could go on like for a minute or two minutes, you know, one word. I said, well, by the end of the first minute, I could do the word, you know, like that, you know. You repeat it five times. So by the fourth or fifth time, I, you know, it was like, it was like perfect. What was the dinner like? At, at the, you went to the Brooks's for dinner. Went to the Brooks's for dinner. So Ruthie, Allah, Shalom. Um, and um, Michael had this gang of the Chavara people there, and they were just <coughs> great. And it was intellectual, and it was spiritual, and someone told some Hasidic mices, and, and we talked about politics, and about the movement, and... It was sexy. I don't want to. I'm I'm in I'm in the height of sexy at this time, and uh, and um, and I never wanted to leave. And all the people I met that night are still my friends. You didn't leave. I never left. I never left. And I mean, the funny thing is, there was just like one little quirk here, which is that I I went away during the end of the year of '68, and then I and I went back to the Chavara when I came back from. Wherever I gone, I think I went to Outward Bound. I went to Outward Bound. It was gone. For the summer. It was gone. No, it was gone altogether. Oh, well, you, you they were away they for had. The I had gone away for the summer. They had moved. <laughs> My life was over. You know, I, I had this great group I was part of, and then I didn't, couldn't find them. You know, and then I don't exactly remember how I found. I think maybe Richie Siegel showed up teaching at Michigan to fill I actually don't remember the how I found them, but then they were in Somerville. So that was so. Then once I found them, and it was a better place. But now they had a whole house. So that was, thank God. Otherwise, I was this close to I would probably become a Buddhist, <laughs> <laughs> so which my mother would have thought was better. <laughs> what did your mother think of all of this at that point? Losing me. She was afraid of losing you. Hide my tefillin. She. Uh, you put it on tefillin. I was putting on tefillin. My mother hid them. She. She. Did she know? We had big, yeah. Had big fights about t- not turning the lights on and off on Shabbos, you know, and kashrut. Oh, kashrut. I became kash- kosher in one day. Like I, I went to the chavra and then I said, I think I should become kosher. And then, then I came home and I said to my mother, you know, I become kosher. And she said, oh, that's too bad because we have the ham with the, with the pineapple circles, you know, pinned onto it with cloves. I guess I remember. And I, so she said, and I know that you like that. I said, well, I do like that. Well, I'll be kosher starting tomorrow. <laughs> so, <laughs> but then I was and I was pretty kosher I was completely kosher at home I had my own little set of utensils and dishes but on Sunday because my grandfather wasn't kosher and he, they served chicken I would eat that because I didn't want to tell my grandfather I was afraid I was afraid afraid to tell my grandfather I was becoming more and more medieval what, what appealed to you about kosher at that point? Oh, there's a, um, uh, there was a woman at the Chavara named Harriet Mann. Harriet Mann was a uh, vegan. And then I also met Everett Gendler, who was a vegetarian. And during that summer of 69 to 70, um, I met a guy named Scott Nearing, um, who had written a book called Living the Good Life. 
Um, he was a friend of the Gendlers by that point. I met him through the Gendlers, of course. I would even say that Everett was maybe a bit of a disciple of his. They were living on Haggis Pond Road in, um, in Andover, and I would go and dig asparagus pits with them, and I was going to be a back-to-the-earth guy. And for me, uh, we, we, and Harry had taught a thing called the Food Seminar at the Chavura, um, and, um, and to raise our consciousness. And art, I think, even got quoted in the New York Times about how kashut should change. You know, it should be eco-friendly um, and like that. And my mother was a, you know, an ornithologist. She was involved with the Audubon Society and yeah. in conservation and and environmental movements. So you know, those kind of things fit together. And then two experiences. I'd, I mean, just I can just go on, you know, because yeah, no, yeah. so um, two experiences. The first experience was that. Um, uh, Richie, not Richie, Michael Brooks, no, and Richie Siegel and me and we raised chickens, we bought chickens and we raised them in the back of the Chavura. In the yard, there's a little yard. A little yard, yeah. And then... Um, and slaughtered them? Zalman showed us how to slaughter them, so we slaughtered them. I slaughtered one of them and then we sacrificed them on a habachi. Hibachis were all the rage back then. Um, you know, little Japanese hibachis. What do you mean you sacrificed them? We sacrificed them because we were doing sacrifices. You know, Zalman didn't, it wasn't just slaughtering them. Zalman knew how to slaughter because Zalman was a Chabad guy, you know, and he knew how to do everything. But, but uh, and I don't think Zalman was there all year, that year. He, I think he just kind of came in from, from uh, Winnipeg. But he, wa- but he was there then. And Epi, Seymour Epstein also, I think, was involved with this one. I have a kind of a gauzy memory of it. Um, uh, but I don't have a gauzy memory of the moment of taking the life of a, of a chicken and, and eating it, flicking it, you know, all the things of it, and f- firing it up and things like that. So th- that was a pivotal experience that I never ate meat again after that. Did also, you, I you think Barry Holtz, I became a vegetarian. And not just a vegetarian, I became a, a kanai, you know, like a zealot. So. If you look in the front page of the Jewish catalog, you'll see a person with a talus over his head, you know, looking out at some in space or whatever, and, and it's me. And you can know that because I started wearing suspenders, because I wouldn't wear a leather belt anymore, and I wouldn't wear leather shoes, only a baseball glove. My baseball glove, which was leather, it was grandfathered in from the. You play baseball. Is that but, true to the state? Yes, baseball glove. No, now I wear leather shoes and a belt, but. But for years and years, I wore only suspenders, and, and I wouldn't. And then I, oh, and then Everett got me Nivellus tefillin. Nivellus tefillin are, are leather from cows that die by themselves from old age, as opposed to slaughtering them. I mean, that, I just want to give you that. That's, we were thinking stuff through. We were not, we were not from, we were, we were in the counterculture. Everything had a rich symbolic meaning, and we talk about it for hours and read about it and think about it. It was fantastic. How influential was um, Everett Gendler in your thinking about vegetarianism and the whole relationship of food to the earth and all of that kind of thinking? Decisive. But more than that, he was uh, influential in my understandings of love. He was in, uh, in, in influential in my understandings of politics. He was quite radical. He was living at Packard Mance in, the, in, an, uh, in an ecumenical center. He was influential in my, in my understanding of religion and why I became a university chaplain instead of just staying as a Hill director. He was influential in almost every part of my life. He was influential in my interest in Eastern religions and Tibet in particular, all those things. Just a couple of years ago, we were in, in Thailand together, you know. We, uh, Everett was, I mean, he was a kid, he was young. But he, he, was, he had been in the movement, he'd known Martin Luther King, you know. He had marched in Selma, and Everett was, for me, I wanted to be Everett Geller, you know. And he was also very beautiful, you know, he had little kids. I'm on the board of the Geller Grapevine Project, you know. I, yeah, of course, I love Everett. I mean, his anti-Zionism became very difficult for me. Um, his insistence on universalism. So I'm on the other side of that. That was later. 
No, no, it wasn't. It was then. Then? Then. Absolutely. Give back all the territories. Everett thought we should not only give back the West Bank and Gaza and Sinai, which we had during that time, but maybe also maybe Tel Aviv and part of Haifa. I mean, he was really, yes, he was very left, and he, did, he was an anti-Zionist. He is still an anti-Zionist. You know, and that had it, because he influenced me on in all the other stuff. But we studied Shir Shirim Rabbah, the Song of Songs, uh, Midrash on Song of Songs, which was all about love. And that was, you know, I would go home and cry. You had an unusual arrangement during your senior year in high school. So you 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 went, you started going. Um, this was you were junior when you first started going to the Chabad. Junior, yeah. So what happened by the time you became a senior? How did you? What were you doing? And how did you come to that place? And, and yes, Brooklyn I don't agree. So two things about Brooklyn I. First of all, Brooklyn I was, I was the head of the student forum, and we were striking against the school regularly. So. You know, some artifacts I have are the newspapers that are student strike and like that, you know. I was getting myself arrested on the Boston Commons, you know. I was, uh, I was willing to do anything, really, you know. We were, I was a heavy activist at the time. Um, and then, so the school was more than happy to get rid of me, to tell you the truth. And I needed to do two things. Number one, I needed to learn about Judaism in a way that I had not learned about Judaism. So I started to go to Maimonides and take classes, including Rav Soloveitchik's um, uh, Gemara Shir. And I made lots of progress during that period of time. It was an incredibly, you know, movement in my head of, towards Judaism. I learned. I was learning. I was like a, in those, that year or two, I was a masmid. I was 100% sitting and learning. It sounded like you were a sponge for everything. I would, I would, access to before. And, and, you know, on the kindness of strangers and then friends, I had, the, I had the people that turned out to be the very best teachers on the face of the earth. I mean, how did that happen? I have no idea. I'm starting to learn stuff from Zalman Schachter. Not many 16-year-olds have access to him on a daily basis. And Arthur Green, who turns out to be quite a significant fellow. I, he, was a, he was only 27, but 28 maybe, you know. But, He's 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 actually quite done quite a quite a nice job and um, and uh, and Joel Rosenberg is not only teaching us but he's writing poetry about the group and it's like it's unbelievable and Michael Swirsky he's kind of keeping the whole thing you know disciplined and together and Joey Reamer Joe Reamer's um, teaching us one day a week and Bert and Bert uh, Jacobson well you know that's not a bad lineup no no no. So, and I'm studying with these people. So I'm going to my mind, like in the afternoon and studying Gemara and, and, and I'm going to Brooklyn High to tell you chemistry. And then, and I'm turning in projects, so I'm still enrolled at Brooklyn High, but I'm going to Maimonides and I'm having a, just an eye-opening experience for me, just like, wow, you know, this, uh, these books on the shelf are all of a sudden turning into words and then ideas, and it's like magic. And then I'm going to the Chavra every morning to study with, at Dorton with this guy, Jim Kugel, who's just like, I don't know, he's like 22. He's a How did junior you fellow. with the Dorton people? So when I, I, I really need to learn, I'm just desperate, really. So I go to, I don't remember, Art or maybe Swirsky even. I, get, I don't remember actually who. I don't know exactly the thing, but they were all very friendly. I mean, they were kids, I was a kid. I was like really a kid, I was a baby, they were kids. Um, and they, uh, and I said, they said, well, you want to take a class, like on Thursday night? So I said, yes, I do. So I came to the class, and that class was taught by Hillel Levine, and it was on Jacob Neusner's book, um, uh, Fellowship in Ancient Judaism, or something, on the Qumran, yeah. fantastic. Um, I don't know if the book was fantastic, but Hillel was very smart, and all the Chavara guys went, in the conversation, we're just like, well, politics and fellowship. I mean, and I said to, I think to Green, I said, you know, I just have to do this every day. I have to drop out of high school and come and study. So he said, well, we don't have an everyday program. And I said, well, I need to come just sit here and study every day. They said, well, there is a group that's getting together that's going to study every day. But they are the, they're the radical communitarians. 
So I said, well, I'm a radical communitarian. So, so they said, all right, see if they'll say yes. So I went to them and it was Steph and Jim Kugel and Charles um, Cohen and Steve Gendon and Terry Sokol. Um, and I think that's it. Maybe. And, so, and were they associated with them? Yeah, just come and study. Just come and study every day. So I went to study every day. Every day. I would get up in the morning, I would drive to Somerville, and I would study with them all morning long, and then in the late afternoon I'd go back and take a class in high school. They spent their morning studying every day? Every day. Mm -hmm. Chomish and Rashi, and then finally Mishnah and, and Gemara, every day, with these people. Or art on Monday, I'm making up the days, but Art on Monday, and Swirsky on Tuesday, and Rosenberg on Wednesday, and Reamer on Thursday, and Jacobson on Friday, and then sometimes Somebody else would come in, and it was the only, and we were, like the Qumran, we were going to be the near Tamid. We felt that constant study would save the world, along with activism. Um, and so, uh, that's who we were. I mean, that's really who we were. We were, we were the Qumran cult. And then, no one else in the Chavara wanted to be the Qumran cult. They wanted to go to graduate school, and like that. And so, we, the, the we left and we moved. The Chavara began as, uh, as an alternative seminary. Yeah, fact. well, because Barry needed to get out of the army, that's basically why I think. What about Art's ideas about starting an alternative seminary? Yeah, I think he, he really wanted to do that. You know, Atzeran and Art Green and... Uh, Atzeran at Brandeis. At Brandeis Joe and Kinsky, Joe, Kinsky. Joe Lukinski. But it, but it never really, I don't... I didn't experience it that way, and it, didn't, and it wasn't that way. Not only did I not experience it, it wasn't that way. There were classes, but the classes were very different than, than seminary, rabbinical school, come to class every day. There were teachers, Eddie Feld was a teacher, you know, and Hill Levine was a teacher in the beginning, but it was absolutely an egalitarian, committed place. Wasn't it, that part of the idea? It was part of the idea. I mean. It's a complicated idea. Uh, we didn't want to do models of the tzaddik, you know. So art was probably less the guru than he thought and more than we admitted. But he was the brilliant figure, you know. I mean, if you went to the Chavara on Shabbos morning, I used to sometimes have to, because I was in high school, I'd stay in Brookline. I'd walk from South Brookline to Somerville to come to the Chavara and spend the day in the Chavara. And I was not driving, you know, I was like already becoming firmer and firmer. Um, uh, and the Devat Torahs that he would give, he just his reading the Torah and then translating, all of a sudden breaking into English during the middle of the laning. Women davening, Sharon Strasfeld by the second or third year, whatever. It was revolutionary. It was never going to be, I don't think that the seminary idea really ever happened. It was a, it was a chavara and not a seminary. Where did the idea of members essentially graduating as chaver as opposed to rabbi? Yeah. Men? Well, Zalman had lots of, um, he thought that Judaism was in some ways um, uh, too narrow in its leadership. Um, designations. So, first he wanted some people to be rabbis and some people to be magidim. Like, so you could become a rabbi or a magid. And then you and could what become. You, mean by a you would go around, you would be like a mashpia ruchani, you would be like a uh, itinerant. itinerant spiritual spiritualist. And, yeah. and you know, he, I remember studying uh, Ula with, uh, with Zalman once. Ula ikla debe rav huna, I think is. The phrase that we studied, and Ula, which means Ula, uh, went and visited Rav Huna, and 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 why do you do that? He wanted to see what Rav Huna did, so he could go then to you know Rav Abrahama and teach him what Rav Huna did, and he would figure it out. So, so we were we were redeveloping, you know, we were kind of rethinking what would we, we were going to write a new Shulchan Aruch. We were going to, you know, for the we this was post Holocaust. This was we needed to redo things. This is the counterculture wasn't the counter the general culture only, it was, it was Jewish culture. And, and so Haver, Rav Haver, is a phrase you can see in the Gemara. Okay. And we were going to be a Haver. And it had the Qumran parts to it as well. 
That class on Neusner's Fellowship in Judaism, I think it's called. I think I saw it. I think it was a hardcover book. Um, uh, it was a significant book for me. Jacob Neusner did not invent the Chavra, as he often said that he did, but he did have influence on it. You know. Can you talk about that a little bit? What, in what way? Um, in a way that uh, Yitz Greenberg would articulate slightly later, right? So this is earlier than that. Um, uh, there was a certain sense that we were in the next cycle of Judaism, what Zalman would come to call the Third Age. Or I think Zalman then finally called it the Fourth Turning of Hasidism. There's all this kind of articles and things like that. But we, what we knew was that American Judaism was, was much more significant than we, anybody was giving it credit for, right? So that when I was growing up, all the teachers were either Israelis or Europeans, you know, and, and we were Americans. You know, that it wasn't all going to end up in Israel. So the Shlilat Gola, the negation of the diaspora, was a significant um, thing to push against. We were going to live in America. Aliyah, Israel would be important to us. It wouldn't be everything. We were Is that not clear at the, during this time. It was a huge post, fight. Post sixty-seven. Huge fight, not clear, but dominant. In the, within the Chavra. Within the Chavra, Bill Novak left the Chavra over it. Um, and there were others who were clearly Israel-oriented, like Bella and George. Bella and George, but Bella and George were Aliyah-oriented, but I don't know. But I talked, it's weird that I don't know, because I remember talking to Bella, and particularly George, about it for hours and hours, the role of Israel. But when Bella and George moved to Israel, and I went, and I, you know, we were, the year before they moved, they came and stayed, I was living in Israel, they came and stayed with me. They were, they were like moving to California, you know, they were, it was like, I don't know, they were, it wasn't, the move to Israel was like to live in a Jewish housing project, it was kind of like Yishar Leibovich's understanding of it. It wasn't a big Zionist expression, Bella was a Zionist, but George was, he was a Bible guy, you know, he was going to encounter God there, you know, I read a book called Encountering God. Um, he was in Bloomington, Indiana, you know, like, it wasn't such a, I don't know, I'll let them speak for themselves. I, I don't know if to comment on them. But I, I, that's my understanding of it. it. It's not that we were against going to Israel or Aliyah um, because some people wanted to go. The Roskies went, the Roskies being not Shana, but Dina. Um, uh, you know, and people would come back with their Israel tales and I came back with mine. The Reamers went. And the Reamers went, yes, and I, I went, right? If you look in the Jewish catalog, you'll see my extremely embarrassing article called How to Travel Cheaply in Israel. Um, uh, um, two things are embarrassing about that article. Number one, that I wrote it, and it's written by a 19-year-old and edited poorly by the editors of the Jewish catalog, so it's a complete embarrassment in almost every way. It sounds, sounds like how to rip off the Israelis. Um, and, and the second thing, more embarrassing, is I think it's the only thing about Israel in the Jewish catalog. Although there were other things that were left out. Consequently, there were... Jewish catalog two and three, right? Okay, but this is the first Jewish catalog. We're rewriting the Shulchan Aruch, and we forget to put in Israel except how to visit and rip off the Israelis. Come on, it's a statement. It's a, it's a thing. We had gone there. It was, we had significant times there. I'd gone to Ulpan Akiva. I'd started learning Arabic. You know, all these things, but where was Israel? Interesting question. It was a, it was a significant question. Why didn't we all just move to Israel? We're going to start an urban kibbutz. Move to Israel. It's the home of the urban kibbutz. We were, we were Americans. That, you have, that's a significant piece of all this. We were Americans that, that weren't moving to Israel and remembered Europe, even though we had never been there. We only learned it from Ruth Rubin Records. You know, we were fake Europeans. We were, a lot of this was fake European, fake shtetl. We were rebuilding the shtetl. It's a lot of nostalgia for that world. Nostalgia for a world that none of us grew up in. But Zalman, had, but Zalman had, and Epi. Mm -hmm. But had some contact with through grandparents, through other and through mysticism. Were, yes. And no, no mysticism. mysticism. Yeah. Not grandparents. Mysticism. So Larry Fine and Danny Mad and Art Green and Gershon Hundert from the history perspective and 
and epi from a kind of a Kishkas perspective, you can go on and on, that the, mystic, that the mystical world that we were interested in transplanting was from the, blooded, the bloody soil of Europe and we we're gonna build it again in Somerville and in America without pogroms. And when I went to Dartmouth College, years later, I built a thing called the Conference on Judaism in Rural New England, where I got farmers and gardeners and things like that to come together in this fantastic kind of Limud, now what we now call Limud, but it wasn't no Limud then, um, uh, experience. And I talked about building Judaism from the margin, right? Because Judaism was, had always been re most creative in a, as a marginal experience. So what could be more marginal than Central New Hampshire, Vermont? And the first speaker at that conference was Everett Gendler, right? Who talked about not only Jewish rebalancing of the natural and the intellectual, but also what kind of seeds to buy for red peppers, you know, and how to harvest alfalfa and God knows what else. So, but I kind of remember alfalfa, I don't know why, what was he using alfalfa for, but it doesn't matter. Um, uh, I just also maybe like the word alfalfa. So, uh, so, so all of that was redoing the shtetl in America, and I was, it was an article in the New York Times and in the Boston Globe about it, and they asked Art to comment on it, and he said, he wants to rebuild Poland, where are the pogroms? You know, because, it, which was like a little shtuch at me. Could you rebuild the shtetl without the pogroms? Because it's America. I, that, that was the question hung over the whole experience. It was a very deliberate experience. Very intentional community. Very intentional. Everything meant something. We, we bought Yiddish records. We didn't find old Yiddish people to come and sing to us so we'd learn their nagunim. We got records. Why was that? Because it was America. You learned songs on records. It was, well, no, I should interpret it. I understand what I'm saying in my own head, I'm, I'm telling you. It was a disruptive experience. We were not trying to reignite the shtetl. It was disruption in the middle of it. So we were not getting survivors to come in and live with us so we could once again be Poland or, or central Ukraine. We were studying Bratislava texts, but with art in translation, with psychology, with history, with modern methodology, with liter literary criticism, we were not Hasidim of the Braslava Rebbe. We were study partners of Arthur Green. And that is a disrupted experience. We were not, it's it was not removed. in a continuity. What? It was a step removed. And it was, I think it was intentionally a step removed. It was thankfully a step removed. We, there are many bad things back, that happened back there. We were not trying to revive them. We were trying to do this whole thing with a positive. We were also positive Jews. We had all grown up as negative Jews before the Six Day War. We were positive Jews now. Why not, though, find people who had direct experience and were carriers of the tradition, Nigunim, for instance, and learn from them? Down the street, you had Benzion Gold, mm. who'd grown up in a world surrounded by Nigunim. Yeah, right. I learned his Nagunim from him in Hillel. When I was a Hillel director, I used to sit and study Nagunim with Benzion Gold. Um, you know, David Roski wrote this fascinating article called Creative Betrayal, um, and that's what we were doing. It was creative betrayal. Benzion Gold came from the Slobodki Yeshiva. He remembers the Nagunim of his youth. We were not interested in restarting the Slobodki Yeshiva. We weren't that disciplined. We weren't that... We, we just weren't. We weren't that those people. We were interested but the in looking. Nigunim were intimately connected to that yeshiva experience. You couldn't separate them in a sense. We you couldn't want. It was inauthentic to separate them. We didn't want to. We were egalitarian. I mean, trying our hardest in the beginning, maybe not so. We it was a little halting. I admit that. You know, in the beginning, it was a bunch of guys and their wives and girlfriends, um, but. We didn't know this stuff, you know? We didn't know about homosexuality. We, only, only later, in my, this is my introduction to it. Like in the second year, all of a sudden, you know, homosexuality came into the Havara and it was, whoa, I was like, you know, it was like, every day was like, wow, intense well, Let's go get back into your Havara experience. See, but, that, but all those things are important because we, did, we were not continuing on that world, we were recreating a world that was, a, as David, I think, correctly points out, a betrayal of the world of Ben Sion Gold. You just used the word recreating a world. Yes, so I, I think that that is the right word, recreating. Recreating as opposed to creating. 
as opposed to creating. Yes, a renaissance in that way. Renaissance. We are, it's a rebirth experience. We we're in a rebirth experience. We were not doing something that had no precedent and was radically new. It just was, but we were not replicating. Replicating. It was not new wine in old casks or old wine in new casks. It was something different. Something new. Something new. That's something what we thought. New. Yeah. And, so and I, I think wanna, we're right. Yeah. So I want to delve into all of this um, a little bit more deeply. So f- to you start with, exhausted. I just wanted to ask you. I'm sorry for exhausting you with all these stories. <laughs> no, hardly. Um, did your Havara experience and your involvement in Havara Shalom at that point affect where you decided to go to college? Of course. Of course. Um, uh, I had uh, deep intentions of going away for college. I couldn't leave. I couldn't leave. I could, this was my world. And I, my girlfriend, then wife, um, uh, was going to Tufts. And so I didn't want to leave her, maybe. But it wasn't that. And I wanted to go to, I wanted to be part of the Chavarot. So I was, you know. And uh, I went to Brandeis because that's where the Chavarim went. They were either graduate students there. Yes, there was a program called uh, Contemporary Jewish Studies, you know, and CJS, CJS right? So Bill Novak and and Larry Lofman and Savin. George Saverin, and so I, I would we would drive back and forth from Somerville, and uh, it was uh, yes, of course, and and I studied with Glotzer and I studied with Altman, and I studied, I did all that stuff, you know, because it was the Chavra. I was building myself to be. So did you major in, in uh, Negis? I yeah. majored in Negis and in physics. And in physics? Why physics? I want to study something real. I want to study, because Alexander Altman asked me in my first day of college um, what questions I would like to answer while I was at Brandeis. Very nice introductory. Introduction to college. College, yeah. I've always, I spent a lot of time t- being in colleges and universities, and I, I took that point. What questions would you like to answer? Really nice, as opposed to what do you want to learn? It's really different. Um, and I said, and I gave him, did you know, know, I did, yeah, I, universe and uh, and you know creation. You know, so he said, you want to study physics? And I said, no mysticism. <laughs> he said, oh, I thought you were serious. I said, oh, oh, it's like my first day of college, and I said. Well, I, I want to be serious. Should I study physics? He said, yes, by all means. That's what you should study. You're good in math. I said, I'm good in math. He said, uh, he said yes, you should study physics. So I studied physics. Was he right? Absolutely. It's the best thing I ever did. Are you kidding? It was, it's, I still think like a physicist. I still, I was never going to be a physicist. I, I, something amazing happened to me in my freshman year in college and then in my fourth year of graduate school. I start to study physics with Stephen Burko and Hugh Pendleton. They were the professors at Brandeis. And Stephen Burko um, uh, was from Siget, like where Wiesel is from, in the Carpath, Subcarpathian Mountains. And, and he started to tell me about Jews and physics. He was a refugee. He was a refugee. He was a survivor. As were many Brandeis Absolutely. Not Hugh Pendleton, as it happens. He was just a fantastic physics professor. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I was just, I just wanted to learn everything about everything. You know, I just, like, I couldn't have been more awake. I'm always a little awake, but I was like, well, really awake. Um, no, no, now I'm also really awake. Um, uh, I'm with the fervor of Fervor. Youth. Fervor. Like. That's exactly the right word. Passion and fervor. So, so Berko started to tell me stuff, just out of, it was a lecture class, but for some reason, you know, he, he was like getting, he, he had a friend named David Weiss Halivni, you know, who was to play a role in my later life. Um, and, and he would ask me if I knew things. Like, like he was getting involved with his own, he was in his own search. It's a marvelous person. He's, he developed the theory of polarization of light. Fantastic uh, thing. Uh, it's a commentary on Einstein's Brownian motions. Just to show you that I haven't uh, forgotten everything. I haven't lost it. I, I think I actually haven't forgotten very much at all. You know, I still teach science a lot. So, well, it, it, here, here it comes. So, um, so he started to give me books to read. Um, 
Science and Civilization um, in China by Joseph Needham, and then and then he gave me this one book called Science Introduction to Islamic Cosmological Doctrines by Sayyid Hossein Nasser. Sayyid Hossein Nasser, N A S R. Sayyid Hossein Nasser. This was like pure elixir to me. I was just like I'm studying religion and science. I mean, religion and science, right? Right there in the page, you know, how the Hakim, you know, Ibn Rushd and Al-Farabi and Ibn Sina and, the, and Ibn Al-Tusi and Al-Biruni, you know, are developing these things and they're giving the, the theological impact of them. So I start writing this guy, Sayyid Hassan Nasser, letters. During my short period of time where I actually can write letters. And, um, and he started you know, writing me back postcards, thank you very much for your letter like that. And he is then the chancellor of the University of Tehran, and he's like the advisor to the Shah. And I have my life work, you know, I'm, I'm going to write science and civilization and Judaism. You know, this is, a, this is going to be my field. What I still... Gave, what gave you the chutzpah to, to, to write to this guy who was the advisor to the Shah of Iran God as an knows. undergraduate? Yeah, I, I, God only knows. I, my whole life is that. What gives, why did I go talk to Bill Clinton about this? I don't know. I really don't know. I'd like to know. Why did I go up to Zal? Why did I go on the cover in the first place? I'm 16 years old. You're not impressed by that? I was impressed. <laughs> <laughs> Lying to my mother that I'm going someplace and in fact I'm going to the cover to study Judaism on the sly? Really? I don't know the answer to that question. I'd like to know. I don't know why I have so many stories. I might just, it might be that everybody has them. I just notice mine. I don't know. I'm unusually lucky. How do I know all these fantastic people for so many years, decades? I don't know. I mean, there's a phrase in Maimonides called Hashkacha Prati. Yes, individual divine providence, which of course I don't believe in, but, but I can't help but notice. Yes. Back to how, did, how did a kid that can barely read, I mean, this is like a nice, a nice place to live in New York City. Like, I don't know, I don't know any of this stuff. I don't know. All right. Back to your story. Years later, I'm That's writing this guy. He never writes back really most of the time, but I'm writing and I'm, I'm just, I'm reading book after book that he's writing and, you know, the Gifford lectures. And, this. and then I go to Israel in graduate school and I come back and, and I'm at Temple University and in the office next to me is this beautiful looking man. And on the door it says, Sayyid Hossein Nasser. So I knock on the door and I say, have you ever heard of the famous Sayyid Hussein Nasser, you know, this is the academic, the scholar? He says, it's me. And I said, no, no, <laughs> it's not you, you know, it's like this is, this is a serious guy, you know, he's a chancellor of Iran. So he says, uh, uh, he says uh, no, it's me. And uh, this is 1979. And, um, and I say, let me tell you, man, it's not you, but I, but I have his books, if you'd like to look at them there, they're absolutely fantastic. He says, you know, we had in Iran kind of a bad summer. <laughs> it's me. I had to run for my life. And this is the first job I got so I could get into America as a permanent resident. And that's why I'm sitting next to you. And he became my graduate advisor. So this whole loop of science and religion and, and mysticism, because he writes on Sufism and things like that, it all came together. And this was my deeper introduction to Islam. And so my career has often been based on my knowledge of Islam. And, and it came from, from... And its connection to science. Its connection to science, and it came from Altman in physics. And Altman, of course, had also written on Ibn Rushd, and he had written a number of things. You know, he was part of the people that wrote on Maimonides and medieval Jewish philosophy based on their Islamic antecedents. Um, and so, uh, so this was the world that I was in. Yeah. I remember my father saying, you'll make a living from this? I don't know, but as it happens, Islam has kind of caught our attention. As it happens, yes. Were you involved with Hillel while you were at Brandeis? I was, but um, uh, Al Axarad was the Hill director, um, and we built a Havara suite. So Charlie Darberson and Jack Gilberg, now Gilron, and Danny Cohen, we, we, and we Davin, Ron Androfi, all those people, we lived together, and we were the Brandeis Neef, you know, the uh, branch. branch, the branch of the 
Chavro used to play him in football. Danny Matt was part of our group for a while, and then he was part of the Chavro group. Did you really see yourselves as a Sneep, so to speak? Absolutely. Absolutely. Did any of them get involved in, in the Chavro itself later? None as much as me, but all involved. That, it was our college experience. That's what we did. We davened in Perlman Lounge, you know, in the kind of Chavro style. We sat on the floor. You know, we... Yes. It was my first attempt at building it myself, you know, this kind of community. But all through college, I went to the Chabra almost every, every Shabbos, and often every day. And were you, was Al, Al Atzerod part of your sort of... Of course. He, we were the kids he liked the best. It was, we were his group. We were activists. We were political radicals. It was during the bombing of Haiphong Harbor and the... In the Plain of Jars, you know, in, in uh, Laos and Cambodia, it was... You started college in 70. 70. 70 to 74. Okay. It was, uh, I mean, one of the most extraordinary experiences of my life was in my, my first day of college, my mother moved me in, but then just, like, did not leave. You know, like how mothers don't sometimes leave. They don't leave. Clean up the room. She'd be mortified if she heard this story, but I, I've told it to her. But she knows. She just didn't leave. I mean, she like dropped me off at ten. I only lived in Brookline. It was Waltham. You know, it wasn't the years when your parents would come and rebuild your room for you. It was like you know they drop you off outside the gate of the college. And it was you know it was different. So um, <laughs> so by by the time three four o'clock rolls around, I am fit to be tied. I want to kind of like murder her, you know, I want to start my, the rest of my life and she's not leaving. And um, she's dusting and God knows what else she's doing and so I want to kill her. And, and, then, and then finally she leaves and I walk across the quad and this short woman named Kathy Powers um, comes over to me and says, do you want to go to a meeting? You look angry. <laughs> so I said, absolutely, I want to go to a meeting. And I go to this meeting with this woman, Susan Sachs and Kathy Powers and you know, all these people. And it was my first day of college, you know. And meeting goes on for a while and we're going to destroy America and overthrow the government. This is my group, you know, this is, I can't wait. Um, Susan Sachs won't talk to men because men are inherently repressive. I didn't even know that, you know, that was like a you new... You didn't know that men were repressive? I didn't. I, I, I didn't feel that way myself. I mean, I was from the Chavra, I was in the Contra culture. We didn't know, but of course it's true, I just didn't know. Um, uh, and then we'd have to like, hear women's voices and men's voices, the whole thing was like, it was, I was in heaven. And so about two weeks into the meetings, um, they, this guy comes over to me and says, you know what, we're going to have a planning meeting tomorrow, which will be life-changing. So you should know if you really want to come to a plan meeting. And I'm saying, I'm there, you know. And, um, and, uh, and they said, no, no, go talk to somebody. Make sure that you really want to come. We can't, you know, this is like a serious moment. You know, we're not having a cult here. We're overthrowing the government. So, so, um, so I call Art. And Art says, are you crazy? Don't go to that meeting. <laughs> you should call the police. So I said, I'm not going to do that. You know, but I, I didn't know you would feel so strongly about it. He says, do you need me to come and get you to take you away from there? I'm, I'll come right now. So uh, I said, whoa, that was like, <laughs> I was totally surprised by that. I mean, we were the radicals. Steph Krieger would have done. If I called Steph, he would have said, of course you're going to go to the meeting. You know, you're going to overthrow the government. So about three days later, they, over, they knocked over the Newton Wellesley Bank. And what happened to them? Just give a... Well, in the, in the long run, they, they went into the underground, you know, on the lam. Um, about 60 years later, I saw Susan Sachs on the streets of Philadelphia. I have an unusually sticky memory. So I'm walking to the University of Pennsylvania Hillel building to go to Shul on Shabbos morning and with Barry. And I see Susan and I say, hi, Susan. I, just, I recognize her because I just recognize the people, you know, then and now. Like, you know, thousands of people I recognize in her. I remember their names, but I don't know who she is. I only met her like weeks in my beginning. I just happened to remember. A quirk of fate. And then she's gone. It's, it's a nothing experience. And then I kind of realized that this is Susan Sachs, that the last time I saw her picture was like in the post office. Um, and six and weeks. Wanted. Wanted. Wanted, yeah. <laughs> um, and then she turns herself in about six or seven weeks later. So. So that's the end of her underground experience. Not Kathy Powers. She was in the underground for 25 years, I think. But I, I'm much more connected. Did Susan Sachs respond when you said hi, Susan? 
She nods and then she disappears. I remember the whole thing as if it was like a movie. I don't remember the whole thing. Then, years later, I'm at Dartmouth and I get this phone call from Susan Sachs. And she says, uh, you know, like I'm in Leavenworth. Um, and first I don't answer the phone and she says, tell Michael that it's, I spell my name S-A-X-E. So I, I said, oh, that's who's actually calling me. <laughs> Again, the phone. She says, you know, Michael, I remember you from when I went into the underground, you know, that, and then before jail that you were involved with Judaism. And I become very Jewish. And I, if I can get a job, I can get out of here. And I said, let me see what I can do. And I connected her to Waskow. And she became the administrator of Olive. And even after that, when I was at University Chaplain at Columbia, I did this whole big kind of 60s meeting renewal. She came to that and spoke with like Tom Hayden, who was like a jackass, you know, and so he was, and she like reprimanded him for pissing off the young policeman. I mean, the story like rippled along, you know, for a long time. You had another spiritual experience, not connected to the cover it sounded like when you were um, an undergrad also, that with Zalman, that involved the Lubavitcher Rebbe? Is that right? Oh, yeah, Lubavitcher Rebbe, yes. Yes, my senior year, just before I wanted to go to rabbinical school, this is involved with physics also, you know. Physics is, plays yeah. a consistent role. Think of it. Yeah. yeah, so so I had Sveikas Bimuna, as we call them, you know, doubts in my faith, which is, which is, is, you know, in the long run of my life, good, you know. And I haven't had them that often, to tell you the truth. I haven't, I don't know, I'm, I have had a lot of uh, consistency. So Zalman said, we're going to go to, to Brooklyn and we'll go see the Rebbe, you know. So, uh, Where was Zalman at that point? Zalman was in Manitoba. But he was coming. We knew Zalman back then. You know, we knew him pretty, pretty often. I, I, don't, I don't know why I knew Zalman during that time so well. Someone else would know that better than me. I knew him through the Chabar for sure, but someone else would be able to, Green or somebody would be able to talk about the influence of Zalman on the Chabar as opposed to on me. Right. You know. People have, yeah. On me it was great. But he's a constant figure, right? Yes. In the first few years. So I don't was, know why he was, though. He was in Boston. He, lived, he was in Boston for only a year, I think. Or maybe two. A year or two. Or two. Uh, but he was a pretty constant figure in that period. And I think he would come periodically after that. He had a tremendous impact on people's relationship to dialing, to spirituality, to mysticism, to all the things that you're talking about. There was no one like Zalman. It was just, he was just a unique figure. I mean, and, and I, I don't even mention the acid aspect of it, you know, which was also a part of my spiritual quest. quest. Yeah, dropping acid with Zalman. I mean, you know, that was like a big... In the Chavarah in the context? In the Chavarah in the turret, on two occasions. Say that again, in the Chavarah In the turret. In the turret. In the, in yeah. the turret. You know, the, it's a three-story building, and there was like a conical turret at the top of it, and in Richie Siegel's room, I think, or somebody's room. And we used to go in the turret and, and, and smoke, and then also these cases drop acid. And it was, uh, More than you with him, or, or was, was it a small group of people? I think it was a lot of people. But, I mean, not a lot, a lot of people, but it was a segment of the Chavra that was experimenting, you know. Right. And I think it was, it was, you know, Green, surely. He wrote that, you know, Psychedelics and Kabbalah, Isaac Lutzer, you know, so we... That was published in response. Yeah. So, we, so, I, so we go to, I go to Brooklyn with a guy named Corey Fisher, who's like an actor, um, and uh, Charlie Roth. I remember, that, you know, this all is really well. It was just at this time of year, because it was Shabbos Shira. And Zalman is walking, I'm going through Brooklyn with Zalman, and Zalman knows like everybody, he's greeting them, they're giving him a hug. Shalom Zalman, they call him Shalom Zalman. You know, no, we didn't call him Shalom Zalman. They call him Shalom Zalman, like that, you know, Shalom Zalman. It's like a, I walked out of the world, you know, into like a whole different thing. And then we stay in someone's apartment, I can't remember, you know, you don't need to know all the details, but then uh, we get to the davening, chakras, on a Sunday morning, I think, um, uh, at 7.70. Right, you know, if you walk in 770, there's like a big base medrash behind, and it's right there, in the, in the ante room. And there's the Rebbe, he's coming in. I think he gives Zalman a hug, that's my recollection. Zalman says no. 
It's an important detail. I think he does. Maybe he doesn't. I feel Zalman's welcome there tremendously. Zalman thinks he's uh, being rejected. So, we, you know, it's, it's not a light moment for Zalman either. Um, he's not doing it just for me. He's, he's doing it, you know. He's going back to what's, Lubavitch. What's the background on this? Uh, that he, you're referring to. He'd been separated. You know, he was one of the first two shlichim for the Rebbe. He and Shlomo. Um, he'd Shlomo gone to Karabach. Shlomo Karbach. He'd gone to Fall River. He had continued to do what he thought was the work of the Rebbe. Um, he felt that the Rebbe, he was the chassid of what the person we call the Friedrich Rebbe, the Yosef Yitzhak. Um, uh, and, um, and when the Friedrich Rebbe died, he said to the to the immediate late Rebbe, that he should be the Rebbe. We need a Rebbe, we need him now, we need him to be you. That's the story that Sam Heilman puts in his book on the, on the Rebbe, so I think it's, and I'm, I feel sure that it's true. I kind of remember Zalman telling my story, but not directly. Um, but the more Zalman gets involved with sex, drugs, and rock and roll, you know, the less Lubavitch he is. But he doesn't think that about himself. He thinks that he is, he even said it when David Ingber interviewed him once at Romamu. He said, I'm still Lubavitch if Lubavitch kept on changing. But Lubavitch stopped changing. But if they had kept on changing, I'd be in the middle of Lubavitch. I, I felt that was 100% true. That was my, almost a creed for me. So then he says, he says something to the Rebbe and the Rebbe comes over to me. And he, <laughs> he wants to know about um, neutrino spin. Do neutrinos spin, and do they spin clockwise or counterclockwise? And then he asked me a comment on proton decay, and then he starts asking me questions on um, ionization issues. And I know all the answers to all the questions. They're like they're not hard questions. They're questions that a first or second year student would know. He asked them like a th like a like a thunder. They're they're coming like a, like waves crashing against my head. I'm like. <laughs> it was like a question after question. I know all the answers. I, can, I only say a, a, a word or, or a fragment of a word and then whew, another question comes. And all of a sudden, I am like, I'm in a different space. You know, my head is, I don't know, I'm, the world is collapsing in my head, you know. And, uh, and then he says, don't become a chassid. Go back, go to the university, like that. And he walks away. The whole thing takes about four or five minutes. And... Um, and I, I'm, I just have to sit there for like an hour, you know, or whatever, whatever it is. It feels like a day. I don't know exactly how long it is, and just kind of recover from that. And I never can recover from that. That was for me a, a kind of um, I, I, the, the velocity of time changed. You know, that's what I felt. And I was just more awake and more aware and more engaged, and it was just a, it was just a transformative moment for me. Why? I think it would have been for anybody because it was, it was kind of boober again, you know, it was, it was seeing that there were realms, you know, I live in, we all live in the world of Asiya, the world of, of, of activity and then sometimes we get into the world of Yitzira, the world of forms, you know, and I'm part of a form and I can see that, but every once in a while you can get into the world of Bria, you know, the world of of creation and creativity and where everything interlocks and I just got a glimpse of it and it was only a second. It was enough. There's a moment, you know, when Moshe Rabbeinu asks to see the face of God or the kavod of God and God says this weird thing. Just after he says, you know, uh, I, I, I know Moshe Rabbeinu. God says, you know, panim uh, panim you know, face to face like a person knows their friend and then all of a sudden Moshe says, well, if that's true, I'd like to see your kavod, you know, and, and, and God says, you can't, you'll die. And, and I figure Moshe says, okay, I'll die. Big deal. You know, you're a god. So what's dying? Dying is easy. You know, I just want to see the kavod. And if it's, that's it, then that's it. And they'd already, he'd already seen the kavod in, uh, in Kaftel, in 24 of Exodus. You know, he'd gone on and see the throne. And the... So Moshe Rabbeinu says, I want to see your kavod. And God says, you can see my back. And in the Chavura, early on, one of the people in the Devar Torah, on that parsha, Kitisa, said, it's so that Moshe Rabbeinu could wear the face of God like a mask. That he could, it's not face to face, it's face in face. 
it's Moshe Rabbeinu not thinking what he thought God looked like, but being able to see through the eyes of God what God saw. And I felt at that moment that the, that the Rebbe, like he had done to many other people, Susan Handelman, who wrote a book called Slayers of Moses and things like that, she said she had the same exact experience I had just standing in line to get a dollar. She said, she said, she, she said the experience years later after me, I'm sorry, years after me, she said, I, I felt the same way. I felt time elongating and then contracting. And, and I figured that's the world of Bria. That was the physics world. That was the, and that he did that through the velocity of his, of his questions. No, I'm sorry. Because of who he was? You know, in Islam, there's the word ayah. An ayah is a uh, manifestation point. Sometimes they're physical and sometimes they're personal. So people go and do circumambulations around uh, the graves of uh, saints because they're ayahs. It's, it's a place in which the realms open up. You know, underneath all this, I'm a bit of a mystic, you know? I'm a philosopher in some ways, but I'm a bit of a mystic. And I, I have felt that in many places. You know, in Assisi I felt it, I felt it in Varanasi, in India, and I felt it with little Bob Jarena. Maybe I even felt it was Seyed Hussein Nasser. What is it that creates that space for you? Um, you know, um, in the image of Tsimsum, of the, it's often translated the withdrawal of God, but I, re I prefer the word um, con uh, 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 concentration of God, right? Mm -hmm. God withdraws and concentrates God into God's self. And so at a certain level of concentration, because it has to be a lot of concentration, Right? All the things I'm saying now are recollections, but the real moments of my life are the ones that I'm not recollecting, but I'm in that moment. Right? The more in that moment I am, the more I can concentrate. So concentration, not just like, you know, get my mind focused, but, but concentrate, taking all the other stimuli in my life and forcing them into a small espresso-like moment. You know, forcing the coffee through the Feels and things like that, they all come in together and then and then you have all the worlds together. It's so rough. You, is it a, a moment of almost perfect kavana? It, the kavana comes before. Kavana is intentionality. So you have to have a kavana. Zaman walking through the streets of Brooklyn and getting up early and things like that. That's the kavana. The encounter is the encounter. It's not the kavana. The encounter is the Ruff Cook has a beautiful poem called uh, Shimuruba, the fourfold song sometimes it's translated as. And in the fourth level is when the, all the other songs, the song of the self, the song of the people, the song of the world, the song of reality, align. And then you sing the Shir El, then you sing the song of God. And I feel sometimes I've been privileged to at least, at least notice that. I don't know if I've been able to sing it, but at least notice it. I've been, I've been lucky, I'm not Zalman. I'm not even Ingber maybe, but I'm, I'm Paley, and, and that's what I got, you know. That was enough. Was there a connection for you between your experience with the Rebbe, this very spiritual experience with the Rebbe, and what was going on in your life in the Chabra and beyond? So the, the, the connection is in two sections. Number one, I had met a person, a man, um, with a big beard and piercing eyes, and it had an incredible, transformative, depth, deepening, you know, uh, experience of, of kind of what I understand to be Keatsy and reverie. So, so th when I came back to the Chabra after that, I was much more alert to my experience of experiencing Tzadikim. Um, and central figures in the Chabra as powerful men. And before that, I had put almost everything into the community and into the transformative nature of the learning. But now I began to deal with Rebbe's. And there were a number of Rebbe's in the Chabra, and that was, that was at very least destabilizing to me. Destabilizing? Destabilizing. Because I just hadn't prepared myself for it. I, I had had this, I was a kid, you know, when I was, I was part of the Chevra. The Chevra was everything. We talked about the Chevra. 
and I'm a good Hevraman. Now all of a sudden I had, you know, big figures, Art and Zalman and to a certain degree Eddie and and the Hillel, you know, there were there were there were people that weighed in. And then it seems like to me, then after the Rebbe, I kind of felt like, whoa, I'm you know, who who am I to be here? Mm-hmm. I hadn't known that before. I was a I was naive. And so, you know, for me as a sixteen and seven year old to walk into this heavy group of people, you know, it's it's unnatural that it could have happened. Right? It's it's not obvious. I should have been intimidated or silenced or I don't know. Certainly not part of it. And I was part of it because I didn't know. When I come back from the Rebbe, I, I do know, you know. And Buzzy probably is a piece of that. You know, he was my Hebrew teacher at Brandeis and he, I took Bible class from him, you know, for a grade. No grades at the Chavra, you know. So now I'm also I'm writing papers and things like that. No papers at the Chavra. Chavra is a dyslexic dream, you know. It's all oral and it's slow and it's deep and it's abiding and now all of a sudden it's, it's people telling me I'm right about this and wrong about that. And it, was, it was very, it, 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 it did change it because the, the Babich has so much Rebbe Center. The Chavura, though, was, at least in terms of its expressed ideal, was non-hierarchical and egalitarian. And yet there was this question of leadership, authority of all kinds. Right. That was somehow at the, also at the center. So it had not been at the center for me, and then it was at the center for me. It was at the center because uh, Art and uh, Michael Birnbaum, you know, from the Holocaust Memorial and like that, took me for like a three-hour walk to tell me I'm not, I wasn't allowed to go to JTS. It's not allowed, you know. Of course, I, if I wanted to go, I could have gone, but but they dissuaded me, you know. They. All of a sudden, there were Rebbe figures telling me things. Yes. So this was. That's right. While you were you were at Brandeis, you were still thinking about being a rabbi. Wanted to be a rabbi. I was one hundred percent directed to being a rabbi. And why were they telling you not to go to JTS? And did that did that? Because they didn't you? like it. It was going to hurt my soul. It would damage me. It was. It wasn't an egalitarian experience. It was a bunch of you know heavy figures, and to a certain degree, they at that moment became also heavy figures. Not that I didn't still love them, I, I did love them, you know, and I felt loved by them. And I still feel loved by did them. Did you want to go to JTS? I, I, had, I had thought that I would, yes. What about RSC? So I went to RSC because Art told me that I shouldn't go to JTS, particularly after Heschel died. Heschel died in 72, right in the middle of my move towards JTS. And I wanted to study with him, so now I couldn't. And yeah. HSC was not? No, in the I was a reformer. If anything, I would have gone to YU. Right. Okay. Right. And RSC was so interesting that RSC Odyssey for me, and I, I think about it in that way. It was a. It's not RSC of today. Um, it was RSC on, in North Philadelphia. It was in a terrible area. It was. It was, and it was just a terrible place. It was also new. Relative. It was relatively new. It started in '68, same as the Chavra. Exactly. Um, and I was a Chavra guy, and Alan Lehman, my friend from the Chavra, we bet, we went together. We almost missed a plane to get there. Lots of stories, but you know, uh, we were slothful, and we were not, we weren't serious in the kind of way that people are serious about things, you know. But we were, but we were imbued with Torah, you know. So we thought that would make up for everything. In some ways it did, and many ways it didn't. But you know, Kaplan. Mordechai Kaplan had understood um, Judaism as an evolving religious civilization, the famous catch line of his. And we said, well, if it's evolving, it should have spirituality in it, because spirituality is the tune of the 20, you know, late 20th century. And, and they said, no, no, we, we meant evolving until the middle of the 20th century. That's it. We're going to then stop. Um, and so that was, uh, that was devastating, you know, in some ways. And, I, and, and the Talmud guy held us in low esteem and the Bible guy was pedantic and it was a very painful experience. In the meantime, I was right, of course, you know, if it's an evolving religious um, civilization, then it should have been more and more like the Chavra and ultimately Art becomes the president and Zalman teaches there and Wasco teaches there and Mordechai Liebling and Jacob Staub, who's my very good friend and all that stuff and the gay issues and things like that. So. I'm completely vindicated by what happened. 
you know. But not in your time then. Just not in my time. I was I was ahead of the curve, right. but completely, completely vindicated by it, right? Let's go back to the Chavara, though, um, and the issue that we were just talking about of... Uh, of Rebbe's. Of Rebbe's. Yeah. Rebbe's. Many people have said that what distinguished Chavara Shalom from um, other intentional communities um, and of, and of uh, Jewish renewal in particular was what became Jewish renewal was that there were no rebbies. Right. There was no rebbie intentionally. So can you just talk a little bit though about that issue, how it actually felt on the ground as the community grappled with it and as art grappled with it and other people who were sort of esteemed charismatic figures within and teachers. Well, you had a number of charismatic figures, right? Not just art, but others as well. Um, and some kind of, I don't know, they were charismatic in some weird way, but just low level. Mm -hmm. Steve's Y-bomb or, I don't know. There were lots of charismatic people and then charming figures, you know. Yeah. Barry Holtz, he was charming, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, and it was a huge tension. It was just a huge tension. Now, one of the real leaders of the no charismatic, no leadership people was Kugel, who was a charismatic leader, leader himself. So the Dorton crowd was really leaderless, you know, and intentionally so, and radical communitarians, no leaders. It would come out of the fabric of the interactions of the people. Did Dorton, Dorton exist at the time that you first began, first became involved? Well, I, I, I first met people on Franklin Street, no Dorton. Dorton means literally over there. And it was, there was, you know, the Hubbard was on College Ave, and uh, I think the Dorton was also on College Ave. It was a green, the a greenhouse on the other side of House Boulevard. It, was, it made me a four, five minute walk. But it was a long walk, you know? I mean, psychic walk. Um, uh, Weirdly, the day I got married, uh, we went back to Dorton, which was being rented by some chaver for the summer. It was and it burned down, like you a fire. Down? Not, maybe not down to the ground, but the whole like top of the floor is all burned up. Yeah, it's like an electrical fire. And Dorton was a horrible place. The chaver was had its own problems, but it was charming. Prayer rooms and macrame and things like that. Dorton had like Steve Gendon's cats in it, and it was smelled like cat shit, and it was horrible. Um, but it was the radical 60s, you know. It was Steph, you know, resisting the draft, and it was Kugel being part of the Harvard Fellows, but, you know, being one of us. And, you know, it was like, it was a place of deep intentionality and deep leaderless society. Um, and in a leaderless society, a 17-year-old could say whatever the hell he wanted, and, and, and that was cherished because, after all, leaderless, right? We're not going to be the leaders of New York. Even if what I said was stupid most of the time, who knows, it might have been stupid most of the time. They were at least committed to it, and maybe I was cute enough or whatever. But the Havara, after I went to, you know, it, it all of a sudden, it, it, you know, if you got invited to Art and Kathy's for Friday night, you weren't, you weren't going to the Rebbe's house, you know? It was dark, and it was, you know, we ate artichokes. I'd never eaten artichokes before, and even I'd eat them in the dark. You could die. Um, uh, you know, they, they in, in the, in the habits of the Chavarov was started by some of those people. Um, and the, habits? Um, uh, the way we do the beer hot, the way we, yeah, you know, we didn't, we wouldn't do the song. We did other, you know, it was Chavarai Nebrech instead of Rabotai Nebrech. You know, I, these are little changes, but it was, I can say it better. We sat in a circle, right? And even at the dinner tables, we sat in a circle around a dinner table. And, and, and it was different than a guy at the Umid, you know, leading the davening. If you, if you have a guy standing up leading the davening and facing away from the community, you're leading it towards God. If you sit around in a circle, both in prayer and at the dinner, you are davening to each other, right? You are, and you're caring a lot about what other people are thinking about you and what you're thinking about them. You are working through the interpersonal all the time. Um, and, the, and the interpersonal has, has marshals and sheriffs, you know? And so the, 
you know, people that are going to come in and say, you're behaving badly here, or you're, you know, you're, you're always late and we, we can't count on you, and you get to teach a class and you don't get to teach a class. Like, and, and, and that was the tension of the Chavra. That was the Dorton people felt betrayed by that. And in some ways, I felt betrayed by that also, but because I was part of the Dorton group, you know, every morning, you know, we used to daven, start to daven every morning. I used to cry. I used to literally break into tears in the, in the davening in the morning. Because? I don't know, you know, because I was moved by the whole thing. I was, I, I felt my life being rescued before my very eyes. But then the Chavra had filled with wonderful people, you know, and so, but they were, but it was, there was a hierarchy there. And the hierarchy was in an aristocracy, and we knew what the aristocracy was. Learning, you know, um, uh, somewhat age, um, if you were there in the first year, memory, um, and Jewish skills. Memory as an institutional memory? Memory in general, memory of the old country, memory of, I don't know, memory. Memory is very important. You know, uh, uh, Yerushalmi's uh, Zachar, kind of, you wrote it after the Chavra, but but it's, it's a good book, you know, so if you have this kind of communal sense of memory that you could access the fra fragmented, you know, past. You know, uh, Zalman wrote a book, I think it's called Future of a Fragmented Scroll. This is, this is all part of this, you know. Mm -hmm. Zalman came in and he was, what, whatever Zalman did, we were, wow. And Everett also, you know, Everett was older, he was had. It was probably the aristocracy of age. Somebody mentioned um, the, the, uh, a feeling of what he called religious intimidation mm. within uh, worship services, worship, and that's what he was referring to at the time. Um, but I think it, it was a broader comment as well, that it wasn't until art actually left, left yeah that some people felt um, able or free or willing to put themselves forward um, as leaders um, of davening or anything else. Um, does that ring right to It you? rings 100% true, but I have to say the loss of Green's creativity, mind, linguistic ability, um, everything yeah. was... It was priceless. Profound. It was profound. So as much as other leaders could emerge, the loss was profound. I, that's, what I, that's what I came to understand, and that's why I think even then I understood it. Mm -hmm. the, I moved to Philadelphia because I wanted to be near him again. One of the uh, ways in which the community came together regularly was for community, communal meals right. followed by meetings. Often. Yep. Not always meetings, but often. Um, always. Excuse me? I think always, right? I think sometimes there were talks or lectures or oh, something yeah, like that. Right. But always, to, as opposed to a meeting. we'd always move from the eating into, I remember Barry was in charge of, just move us into the next room. <laughs> yeah, but there, but, some, but there were different purposes, and, but often, often these meetings. Yes. Um, and many people have commented that these, these, were, these were quite fraught, emotionally fraught meetings and tremendous tension between what, what, what some people have called individuality and communality. Well, we had agendalist meetings. Did, you ever, did anybody else mention that? Uh -huh. That we had a thing called the agendalist meeting, and that was when we attack each other in a kind of a musser way, you know? You're really pissing me off, you know? You're, you're, you're taking up too much airtime. You're, you know, like, it was, we, we, it was a, it was a criticism circle. In the name of openness. In the name of community. Not just openness. Openness would just be like, I'm telling, I'm telling you what I really think. That would be honesty. Honesty and openness often go together. This was very much, we are, we are the group of people. We, are, we have a special spiritual mission. We need to, and we need to be together in it. And therefore, we are going to criticize each other to be together. Did you and you could get hurt in those meetings. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And you could hurt people in the meetings. I think I did a little bit of both. Yeah, I feel, I regret them a little bit, but it was like a little communist, you know? Not communist, communist. <laughs> like re-education circles. Uh, 
another thing about these meetings is that, and the community was that it was it was largely a male community. Yeah, it was largely community. yes. I mean, the women who were there in the beginning were girlfriends and sometimes wives. Right. But they weren't members in the same sense. Uh, they weren't formal members. And nobody, no women that weren't connected to men in the beginning. There was one, people said. I don't know. I don't know. Barbara Mankow? I don't know. Might be. Barbara Mann, I mean, Harriet Mann. Maybe Harriet Mann, Alex Orr. Maybe Harriet. Harriet Mann, maybe. It was one person. Um, and but basically, it was Ruby a and yeah, but she was connected to no one. How do you think this affected sort of male to male kinds of relationships in the community? The fact, the fact of its maleness. Well, um, I think that I, I used to have a theory in the Chavara which that there were four things that you would do all out, right? Um, daven, if you daven less than with your whole heart, you weren't really davening. Learn, if you didn't really engage in the learning, you weren't really um, learning. Um, uh, something else, and baseball. Um, uh, because baseball, like if you're a habit of catch and you don't throw the ball hard, you know, then it's just like, then it's a toss and nothing. But, but I knew that baseball was a, was a um, placeholder for erotic connections. And so one of the things that I learned in the Chavara and which I think about and, and affects me a lot is the um, male nature of this community engaging in highly um, uh, uh, intense relationships um, and trying to deny the eros of them when the eros is going to come for sure. And I was a ten tender boy um, at the time and that was the first time that I was ever exposed to that. So remember, at the end of every davening we would hug each other hard, hard. Not just like little clamshell hugs, you know, I mean, um, bear hugs, you know, and we were we touched each other a lot, and we ran, and we we were, and we were of that age. And there were some people that were quite open to that experience, um, and I wasn't one of them. Um, but I was swept up in it um, to a degree that I would not have expected um, in the rest of my regular life. So, it sounds, in some ways, to me, the ways in which young girls and women have crushes, in a sense, on, on, on other women and older women, charismatic women, strong women. We, we, we had crushes on each other. We did. But we had more than crushes, you know. We were, we were highly engaged with each other. You know, the, the Gemara is written by people that are highly engaged with each other. You know, it's written, it's, those are the stories. Um, and you don't have very much of those erotic, the erotica in there, but you have a little bit. Um, but we were, you know, Joey was studying the stuff with Kohlberg and, you know, also, it was the, the Eros of it. You know, we're, we're in a post-Freudian world. We, we know about Eros. There was Eros. And, the, and, and a, look at Shabbos, you know, I learned this about Romamu, I learned it about BJ at a certain time, I learned about Lincoln Square another time. This, the, you know, this, these are good pickup joints as well. And, if you really wanted to get laid, you could probably do it at the Chavara, you know, on a Friday night. I was, I, I responded to that in a very clear way. I got married. At age 19? At age 19. To your high school girlfriend? To my high school girlfriend. I just wasn't, I mean, I, I in, and after long reflection on that, I think that was really a part of it. If you learn with a person the way we learn with each other for long enough, and it's not that long, you fall in love. That's just the facts. It happened at Bravinder's. It happened at Dartmouth when I was at Dartmouth. It happened. It happens all the time. You fall in love, and sometimes the person's appropriate. Sometimes the person's not. I fell in love with these people, and I fell in love with them in a way that I had an activity that could sustain it. And the erotic dimension of that was also there, and it made the whole thing much more fraught. Did, did the charismatic nature of the leaders sort of contribute to that, or not? 
course, that contributed to it in an enormous amount. We just did want to tie, tear the walls down between us. That's what the meetings were. You can read about it in the Manual of Discipline but in the Qumran texts. They had it too. You know? So if you sit and you have the meal, you know, with the... I can remember the meals, you know, the string beans with the mushroom soup on it and the little crinkly, you know, onions, you know, fried onions. Like, I, I can remember who bought the bulgur we, you know, and we all went to the co-op and things like that. But that was all a... That was all a staging area for very intense meetings that had had intense results of them. I mean, there's a lot I'm not saying here, you know, because I'm not going to say it. Yeah. But, but I, I don't want to blink on it either. And by the way, Brook Farm, you know, the transcendentalists of Brook Farm, they also had to talk about this. There is no communal experience. And we were a communal experience, more than the Fabrang and more than the Yochavara. Yes. We were a communal experience. We were in each other's faces. What role did women have in these early years? So in the beginning, they were everybody's wives and girlfriends, right? Um, and it was the, you know, uh, the, the post-birth control era. The beginning so of sexual liberation. Sexual liberation, so... Yeah, you know, I, I always say this as a joke, but, it, you know, my theory of divine providence is that God comes to Adam and Eve and says, okay, you sinned, you have to be good now for 5,000 years, and then God comes back to us in 1968 and says, all right, for the next 15 years, have a fantastic time. I use another word usually. Um, and I was exactly the right age for the fantastic time. Thank you, God. Um, you know, so, <laughs> I mean, really. You know, that was, that was the, and, and people took full advantage of that. It was one of the only times in human history, I think you go to some woman at the end of davening and say, would you like to sleep with me? And they would say, okay. <laughs> like, you know, like, I won't mean anything. I might not even remember your name. Okay. You know, it's only rubbing. It's the afternoon. I'm, I'm happy. Sure. Sure, it's Shabbos. Why not? Let's go. Let's go. Really, that, like that. Um, uh, but that also led to lots of other things, and people felt, you know, bruised up by it. Then, in the third year of the Chavra, um, Sharon Strasfeld came. That was a big change. She could really daven. We didn't have anybody that could really daven before that. A woman. Um, a woman, yeah. We didn't have any women. Sorry, I don't know why I said it that way. Um, uh, we, the women just, it, it, became, it became a thing of the Chavra that it should be egalitarian. In the beginning, we just didn't have any liabilities. It's not like you couldn't get an aliyah if you're a woman. But remember, most of us are coming from suburban synagogues where women didn't have aliyot, even in 1968. I'd never seen a woman have an aliyah. Not that I'd ever seen people daven while sitting on a, on a cushion on the floor. You know, everything was new. But that just didn't occur to me that, that you could do that. Right. And then Art. people were changing the liturgy. Art, in an article that was published, I think in Pocket Trigger, of the Yiddish Book Center of the past year, talked about this period as a, the beginnings of the Chabra Shalom as a pre-feminist moment. It was a pre-feminist moment. It was, it was, you know, Stonewall had been, what, a, you know, 15 minutes before? We didn't, you know, we had a few people that were quite out, you know, Mari Pomerantz and Burton Weiss, people like that, they weren't in the Chavra, but they were around the Chavra a lot. And there were some people in the Chavra that weren't. And, and I just never heard of that stuff. I really hadn't heard of it. You can't imagine. We didn't know that women were supposed to be equal. We just didn't, it never occurred to people. He's right. It was pre-feminist. But it was then feminist. That was... It then became feminist, you're saying. Absolutely. And I, I do think that we tried, um, both men and women tried as hard as they could to catch up to that. And that we, and, and we felt bad about it. Yeah. We'll come back to that in a minute when we talk about um, Fila. But I wanted to ask you, were you aware of the, the Brit, the, 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 uh, uh, the, the Harat? what was it called, the, the covenant that was uh, circulated and proposed. Um, it was, yeah. When was that? Mm. Is that in your first, in the first year? No, second, second year. Second year. Second year. Why? Yes, it was the first year in Somerville. First, first year in Somerville. Yeah, so I, since I remember Franklin Street, that I think of it as the second year, and it was the second year of the Chabra, that's what we call it, the second year of the Chabra. Mm -hmm. And what, why was there a breach? Uh, that was written by whom? What, what, what was that all about? 
I can't was, that a, was that a response to tensions, these tensions around relationship within the, within the Chavara? First, that's a long time ago. I have to kind of remember. I actually do think I have a copy uh -huh. in my file on the top of that. In that. Uh -huh. um, and I remember it well. Well, I, I, I respond to it in the following way, and it's a not a full response because I can't remember, you know, otherwise. Sure. And when I can't remember something, it just, you know, it shocks me. But, um, uh, you know, the New York cover with uh, or John Rusquet and people like that, they had no membership, right? They, no, they did have membership. For Bregan, they had no membership. I think the New York cover, anybody that wanted to join could join. They had interviews and they could reject you? Yeah. Mm. For Brangen, had none. I trust you on this. Um, uh, but we did have membership, right? And you could get rejected. And you could... Did you actually have to apply for membership at some point? 100%. Wait, it wasn't wait, me. Wait. Me, I was, I was a shoe-in to the Chavura, you know. But you but had to go through... It was my wife that... Uh, my wife at the time, you know, she had never... She was my wife. That's the only connection that she really had. So Ellen Cohen, you know, she was, she didn't lead davening, she like did cooking and things like that, but she wasn't like a, you know, she wasn't coming to classes very much, and she was like a chavra person, um, and yet she wanted to be in the chavra, you know, she I didn't want to be in the chavra or not, and she had to go through, through interviews, and people said, well, we don't really know you very well, and you're not really opening up yourself, and and you know we we you know you have to invite us more, and you know, all these kind of things, and. It was like a real, it was somewhat traumatic, and the, and the breach was somewhat around all that. You know, you, there, were, there were conditions to being in the Chabra because we wanted to make it an intentional community. But yes, I also had interviews with, with, the, with, the, with the Chabra members, but I, I, I don't feel that they were tense for me. I was already very much part of the group. Was this at the point that you were at Brandeis? And I was, yes. Right. So you've already been part of the group. It I, was wasn't, I imagine that it wasn't very tense for you. It wasn't tense for me. But we were rejecting people right and left. You know, just we should be safe, we should be clear about that. It was a closed group. And lots of people got injured by not being uh, admitted to the Chavara. Mm -hmm. There's a famous case of a couple that now lives in Houston. I think you might have died actually. Um, we're in the Wexner program. They're wonderful people. Um, and... Um, he was going to Harvard Business School, you know, and so we said, we're not going to have a guy from Harvard Business School in the Chavara. So we just, you're not our kind of guy, you're in Harvard Business School. And, and I remember Sharon was going to quit over that. Like, what does it mean? Because guys, business school, that's enough of a reason not to have them. And, 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 and it was something like that, you know, it was a kind of a manifesto of, of ideology that if you didn't feel part of that, then you really weren't in the Chavara. The Chavara became pretty well known all of a sudden, you know, we kind of, we felt ourselves to be slightly famous, you know, not like famous, like famous, but famous, you know, with like... How, how did that happen, that people knew about what was going on? The Chavara started having lots of people come on Shabbos morning. Friday night was only for the members and some fellow travelers. I always went on Friday night, I, I think even before I was a member, but it was small. And then you went, and then everybody, everybody went to someone's house for dinner. And if you didn't get invited to dinner, you could invite yourself to dinner. That was the rule. So, so you know, I'd like to come to your house for dinner. Okay, they couldn't say no. Everybody had to live within walking distance, except for Hillary Bean. Um, uh, sort of. Sort of. No, no. I, I, Annie, Nama. Wow, Ellen. Ellen. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Ellen lived <laughs> at Tufts. <laughs> I was oh, easily. So you were close. I was yeah. close, and we even easily in walking distance. Um, and then I lived on Kenwood Street, you know, so it was right across the street. Um, Did you and Ellen become an inviting couple in addition? Because this was a the Chavar Shalom was known as the Shabbat inviting community. That's right. We were Shabbat inviters. You were absolutely every week. Every week you would be. Every week. So you didn't end up actually going to other people's houses so much. We were very much more inviters. We were very settled. We were, it was a big statement for us. We lived close. Ellen was a really good cook. We lived in a nice place. I could afford it. I don't think that the affording it was a minor aspect. You know. What about the... People were graduate students. They didn't have any money. 
What about the style of uh, Shabbos dinners? Yeah. You know, it, it was very stylized. You know? Very. People, and people had somewhat different styles, ways of doing it. No? They did, but then we would complain about them. I mean, there was a certain... Such as what? I mean, what, what, were there people, and I guess part of my question is, you hadn't grown up with a rich Arab Shabbat it's true. dinner tradition. Right. So how did you learn, imbibe, how you wanted to be as an inviter? An inviter? Uh, it's, an, it's an excellent and complex question. Um, I'm just kind of calibrating my, the honesty and openness of my answer here. Um, uh, <laughs> it was all fake. In some ways, right? No one really had grown up in this way. Green didn't grow up in this way. Zalman had grown up in this way. Epi, you know, was the repository of authentic uh, dinners. When I was very young, um, uh, in Brooks and Feld and people like that would invite me over, I learned a lot about it. To do it myself was like a real thing. And then people would come and criticize me. They would come and tell me, you know, you don't say the birchat right, you know, this is not the tunes we use. This is, uh, we, you don't sing enough after, you don't sing enough before. You, you know, I, we, I would ask, and people would, would, in no uncertain terms, tell me how to do it. Um, if you hadn't asked, would people have told you? I think yes. Yes, they would have. It was highly stylized. There it was. was. Was there a Chavura style that was sort of within bounds, or was there variability within that? It sounds to me that there were, people did it somewhat differently. They did somewhat differently. So, so Sharon and Michael were firmer because he had gone to YU and she had gone to Stern. She wore a tichel on Friday night. You know, like it was a, that was a firmer experience, you know. Um, but no one used lights, you know, even the people that used lights on Shabbos didn't use lights at the dinner. It was always dark. It was always candle. So it was always grains, you know. Everybody was always being a vegetarian because of, Sensitivity. We were trying to be sensitive to each other. Maybe cost, um, as you were green saying. and maybe cost. Green was long, right? You had long dinners. Like if you get there just after diamond, we get home like eleven o'clock at night. You know, it was very long, and you would only understand about a third of what had gone on. But you know, and I didn't know what I was eating all the time. He actually ate. I shouldn't say that he had chicken that they would start making before Shabbos, and by the time we ate it, it would had disintegrated into the pot. Um, but it was all very. You know, you went to Green's house, which. Whew, it was fantastic. Um, uh, Brooks ate meat regardless of who you were, you know, like he was in your face in that way. Uh, so there were like, there were lots of differences. Then there were single guys, you know, Joel Rosenberg and George and Richie and people like they weren't, they didn't have wives. I was, I had a wife right from the, almost the beginning, you know. So, so we were the invited because we had a family and they were the single guys, they would come. So the single guys would tend to be invited by... Or they invite the themselves. Or they invite themselves. Yeah, often they invite themselves. Mm -hmm. But I set up my apartment so I could do all this stuff, you know? Long table and more chairs than usual, most people would have. And, and you know, we bake our own challahs. You know, we were the do-it-yourself Jewish kid. So... You know, I, I was very much interested in the, in the goodem, you know, and, I, and, and you come to my house on a Friday night and we sing a lot, a lot. Then sometimes we have home and homes, you know, like come to my house on Friday night, I'll come to your house on Shabbos lunch. <laughs> was Shabbos lunch a thing? It was absolutely a thing. Absolutely, yes. Shabbos lunch was a thing. And we would gather, I mean, the whole, I remember these whole things now that you mentioned it. We would like gather in the foyer of the Chavara and you would gather like into the little groups that you were then going to escort home. It was something very beautiful. I mean, Alfie uh, Marcus and Judy, Alfie and Judy Marcus lived uh, next to us. And we were punked. We would light the Shabbos Licht exactly the same moment we could see each other through the windows in some of them. It made you feel like you were in, you know, I don't know, Dolia or, you know, I don't know, Green Brisk. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> you know, and... I mean, you know, some, and then there was the going around, right? So there was, there was a highly stylized also. Some families that we went to, you know, some couples, everyone would 
bring a story and a little talking point, and other people, they let the conversation go. Wherever but, it would go. Wherever it would go. But many people did not. You, we did Parsha, we did, someone brought a text. You know, as I got more learned in things, I brought, you know, better texts, I think. Lehman was my very good friend, and we would pick texts out and study them on the afternoon, you know. Hebrew was an issue. Hebrew was an issue? For me it was, yeah. I didn't, my Hebrew wasn't very good. I couldn't just kind of sit and translate, but other people on the table could just sit and translate. So, One of the first things you said about your Havara experience overall was um, the intensity of your first experience of Kabbalah Shabbat and then, and then Shabbos dinner at the Brooks's. Right. Did, as time went on, and this was part of the fabric of the communal life, did those continue to be such intense, spiritually, spiritually intense? There's nothing like it. There was nothing it like davening on Friday night at the Chavra. Nothing like it. It was wonderful. Almost without failure, every week, something was, it was great. The singing was great. We knew each other. We had... I'll just say, say two things about it, you know. I remember years later, like in the early 80s, David and Shana came to Hanover when I was the rabbi. And they, and they come to Friday night dinner and Friday davening. And I had, based on the Chavra, built a davening for the Dartmouth Hill that was like the davening of the Chavra. We knew each other well. Many of the people became rabbis from that group. Nancy Flam became the head of the, of the Spirituality Institute, and David Seidenberg so wrote, wrote, wrote just for a book on ecology and Kabbalah, and Shirley Idelson became the dean of students at the, at the Hebrew Union College. I mean, it was, it was a very talented group of people that went on. Rob Eshman is now the editor of the Jewish Journal in L.A. They were all at, at my table in my little davening at Dartmouth Hill, and, and, David, and David was in tears at the end of it. He said, that is, that's what it felt like. I did the whole thing. Flickering candles, not electric lights, I let them burn out. The whole thing. So that was, you know, that, that was like amazing, right? That was like so a this, spiritual experience. This formula that you're, that you're talking about, so to speak, almost a formula. I can say it, yeah. Um, formula. For, for Kabbalah Shabbat, followed by these small, intimate, intense dinners, worked. Can you imagine? Wouldn't that be great? Yeah. It's not that I'm that far. You know, I still go to Shul and I still have dinner. It's on Friday night. Yeah. Every Friday night. Are they the same? They're not as good. I'm older. We don't turn the lights down. Still good, though. Better than most people. I think I, I stack my Friday nights up against anybody else's. They were neo Hasidic. They were really neo Hasidic in that way. They were. They were intense and they were literate and they were vibrant and, and, and very fresh. Something very fresh Did about it. Did music play the role in that? So Green used music and many people used music and I didn't use music. At his Shabbat dinner? At Shabbat dinner, dinner yeah. I think you did what he, not yourself? I did not. I was firmer. I became firmer and remained firmer than most of the people. Well, so why didn't you use music? Because it was electric. I, you, mean, you mean electric music? No, I mean singing. Oh, singing, yes. I sang and sang and sang. Yeah. Oh, yes, yeah, singing. But he, he put records on. What kind of records? Box B minor mass. Oh, Miss Aluba once. Um, uh, the Gunim, you know, from the Mudgets album. Um, like that. Recorded music. That's what I meant. But I didn't. I only sang. But I sang my heart out. I love singing. I love it. I love it then, I love it now. I still sing on Friday night. I still sing between when we wash our hands and before we say the mozi, I, uh, I sing three or four in the gunam. I, 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 I'm committed to it. And it works. Yeah. It works. Yeah, it's great. You know, Eben Leader, my mother died in, 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 um, eight years ago. And Eben Leader came to, on Christmas morning, we, we, the Christmas part was not significant. But that's what, what it was. And he came to my mother's apartment um, and Reamers and Greens and Laymans and Novaks and, and Polands, Nehemi and Larry Poland and all these people. What was your people. connection to Evan? Nothing. 
Well, the leader minion in Israel, because the leader minion in some ways has a chavara part of it, you know? So, and it was Hanukkah, and he led the davening, and my brother and sister and I just cried and cried and cried. And, I re and my brother-in-law, who's not religious, he came over to me and said, whoa, I, didn't, I just didn't know that's what davening was. I never, who would know that? Anybody would want to do that every day. You would, you would never not want to do that. And I said, that's it. Because I, as, long, as soon as, you know, 40 years with all these people, 45, whatever it is, it was, we were sitting on the floor again. Yeah. The um, prayers mean something. Prayers don't mean anything in most shuls. You, you can't say what the prayers mean, what they're about, how they work. In the cover of the prayers worked. We knew what they were about. It's remarkable. Almost no minion does that. Was it simply about knowing what they meant and what they were about, or was it also to do with really understanding the structure? They were 100% mirrors. So what we looked like that day when we looked into the prayers is how we saw ourselves differently each time. They were, they were um, uh, self-expression uh, self and also communal cohesion experiences. Not everybody, right? The, on Shabbos morning, a lot of people came to the Chavara. They all enjoyed it. They sat on the couches. They sat on the couches. Yeah. But we were having a different davening. There was no doubt. We were having a different davening. You were having a different what? Different davening. We were experimenting. We were getting to know each other through the, mm -hmm. through the liturgy. It was a ritual. It's different. Many people talk about the, the uh, tension between innovation and tradition. Um, in, in tefillah and in the, the structure of the service, um, the liturgy at Chavrat Shalom. Mm. Um, how did you experience that, that, that tension um, yeah. and the kinds of, what kinds of experimentation, do, sort of, do you recall, that, that worked or that didn't work? You know, um, uh, Ain't um, Kamacha didn't work that. No, not Ain't Kamacha, but. Uh, a what? Not a Dunalam. The one just before. You know, Ain't Kalainu. Didn't work. Gone. Um, <laughs> you know, we didn't even say it Minyan Mat because we're the Boston Chavra. We don't say it, right? Um, uh, Psuke de Zimra, silent often. Um, or maybe one, one of the Tehilim, not all of the Tehilim. Um, themes that would people would pick up so that they would say a pasuk that would be, you know, go the way through. Maybe it was a snowy day, and so we would do the snow sentences in it. Um, every, every, the, it, was, it, was, it was dynamic, um, but we used a burn bomb sitter, and we used Nusach Svard. So, you know, it was different than, I don't know if that makes any... You know, well, say, say it for the... Yeah, so... so there are three kinds of liturgies. There's the Ashkenazi liturgy, there's the Sephardic and Edot Mizrach, the Eastern land Jewish liturgy, and then there's the liturgy that Hasidim um, used. And the Hasidim used the Sephardi um, liturgy, but for Ashkenazim. <laughs> so it was, a, it was a very small minority. You know, you had to kind of look for the books. And we used that. We used Nusach Sephard. So it has more mystical elements, Keter Yitnu, you know, the crown of God and, and like that. So the mystical elements in our things were both innovative, because they weren't using that at Mishkan Tefillah, they didn't even know what it was in Mishkan Tefillah. Um, uh, and yet, there was this fidelity to a tradition, so the tradition was consistent. People talked about the traditional sensibility. There was. That was at the heart. But I can't say that it was an easy um, uh, negotiation. First of all, could be too long. The service. Yeah, it's too long. You know, if you do it intentionally, it's too long. It goes on for hours. You know, and we didn't like that. So we cut a lot of stuff out. So it's a kind of a, in, in, in Hungary, there's a Jewish movement called Neolog, um, which is orthodox, but, but only during the stuff that you do. A lot of stuff you don't do. <laughs> like, you know. 
Like the driving on Shabbos, we don't care about that. So we drive on Shabbos. But when we go to Shul, we expect Shul, you know, from. So, so we were firm about some things and we were completely nothing about other stuff, you know? What were you firm about and what were you nothing about? Or, or just completely innovative and experimental. So we were mostly firm about from Nishmat until, you know, like a, the centerpiece of the davening. What does that mean, from, that you were mostly from about, I mean, traditional about it? If you didn't do it, you had to really have a reason not to do it. If you innovated at all with taking out one of the blessings before the Shema, or not you was doing, doing the Baruch Hu, or like that, you had to like really, you, you know, after Zalman, who was much more experimental than any of us, because he knew the liturgy so much better, Davenology, as you can see, that was, we, we had said things that we had kind of agreed on doing. But all the other stuff, you, you, you were on your own, and, and you, we prepared the dominant. We really prepared. And most people don't prepare dominant, they just dominant. We prepared. You, on your own, meaning that each person who was leading... Yeah, I led a lot. I mean, I led the dominant a lot. I've never led the dominant as much. When I was at Dartmouth, I led all the dominant. But in the cover, I led the dominant a lot. At what point did you feel comfortable starting to lead dominant? I, I was pretty young. I think I was maybe, a, maybe in the third year when I decided I'd do it. It may be that at my Ufruf is the first time that I led it, so I was still in like in 19. And I felt comfortable, I don't know why. I really don't know why, but I, I davened a lot, and I think I have a good enough voice. So I think that was helpful to me. And I wasn't innovative in the beginning, but then I was innovative, you know, I really, I worked hard on it. What, can you talk about some of the ways in which you, you decided to experiment and innovate? And what worked, what didn't work? From your perspective. Well, you know, there's a phrase, Aftichonte um, Valbaltimot, um, I said the I said it in its course and will not let it shake. And so I used that once as a I just kinda why this is coming to my mind, right? Because insecurity of saying all these things to you. Um, uh, but I used it as a kind of a mantic element. So at the end of every one of the Psalms and even the pieces of the of you know of the Baruch Hu and the Shema and the, and the Amida, I used the phrase, um, and so the people start, and I would yell it sometimes, and other times I would whisper it, and sometimes we, I would repeat it many times. Like 30 or 40 times like that. So it was, you know, and, and it was at a time in which I felt that the whole Havro was particularly uh, shaky and insecure, you know. People, we had just, it was just after the 73 war, I think, and like that. And so we, and it was maybe about the 73 war. So, so that would be like an example of, of something that I did. But of course, it changed the whole davening because it's a, a phrase that you're using in a, in a repetitive way. And I, I, you know, I, I, I just kind of remember that being said, so I never did it after Can you that. translate it again from? Um, he sets the world in its course and does not let it shake. It's from Psalm 29, 93, I don't know. You know where it's from, it's just after uh, Tzadik Atamar. Yeah. So, and then Tzadik Atamar we used to do, we did in big band. Tzadik You know, that we have, we do, you know, trombones and things like that. We march around. Yeah, because it was. <laughs> yeah, we march around. You know, one time I came and there were tables in the, in, in the, in the prayer room, you know, and everybody was wearing hats. You know, like, so we, affected Poland. I, you know, it was very creative. You could do that. Kazoos, people bring kazoos. Huh. Um, no musical instruments. No musical instruments. I don't know why. Rhythm blocks, things like that. No, no guitars. No guitars. No, I can't make, that's not, maybe not right. Maybe Novak played the guitar when he was done. He's a really good guitar player. Um, yes, maybe there were music, musical instruments. Yes, I'm sure that there were because Zalman had once said that the reason we don't do musical instruments is the, the recollection of the destruction of the temple. And he said, if we keep on recollecting the destruction of the temple, don't worry, we'll be destroyed completely. <laughs> he says, yeah, we should st stop mourning the past and start rebuilding the future. To what extent do people bring in uh, material that were sort of non, non Jewish sources? Just other sources, yeah, completely. yeah, they did. Um, you know, uh, 
Do you remember? I mean, yeah, Saul Patchen Martin. and you know and and uh, Marge Piercy and you know, lots of poems and and Merle Feld wrote poems, you know, in a kind of you know in a mm -hmm. feminist voice, and uh, then people translated the prayers into a feminist voice sometimes, you know. At what point was that? I think that was actually in the fourth year. We didn't do it until the fourth year, but I can't be for sure. I can't remember the distinctions. But I remember doing it. I remember there's a whole translation workshop project to do that. Let's go back for a sec. When you first started, did women play any role in public worship that you recall? Not that I know. They did. They had Aliot. They had Aliot? Absolutely. And, and maybe they even relayed. Before Sharon? Before I think so. I think so. They had, had Aliot for sure. We weren't trying to be sexist. We just didn't know. Were, when were women counted in a minute? I think always. I think always, to tell you the truth. Is that uh, other people said that? I believe uh, we were told that there was a retreat mm. at which someone needed to say Kaddish. And there were nine guys. Was it Mona? Might have been Mona. I remember that kind of. And then the, there was a decision made. What can I be counted? And then the decision was made. Because so it's obvious. It was obvious oh. to people in this community. We weren't bad about it. Mm -hmm. We just didn't know. No one had ever done it. Yeah. You know? When do you remember there being any conversation about women's roles in public worship? Well, the, and, and in the position papers, there were already position, you know, comments about it. Kathleen Cohen, didn't she do in a, you can look at it, I think it says, I'm the Kathleen monster or something like that, and she drew a little picture of a monster. Because of women's roles. We, that phrase, you know, is just a bunch of guys with their girlfriends and their wives. I know, I remember that phrase. Don't worry, you know, we, we I repent. I'm sorry. It was stupid. Mm -hmm. We should have done it right away. We didn't know. I didn't were know. You, were you aware, you as a community, aware of the beginnings of Jewish feminism, of the founding of Ezra Nashim and the stirrings of... That those conversations yes. that were happening often in New York and, and 100%. in retreats. Yes? We went to uh, Weiss's farm in uh, Somerville, New Jersey, I think, or some place in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. Well, I remember all this crap. is unbelievable to me. Um, uh, and Martha Acklesberg and uh, Judith Pascal, who were both then married, one to Bob Goldberg and one to uh, David Mendelssohn, if I remember correctly. Allah wa shalom. Um, uh, and the, like a fight broke out, you know, about it. Um, and the Fabrengan was much more f progressive. They were egalitarian completely from the start. But they didn't start until 71. I know, so this was, uh, this was 70, years. 71, you know? Yeah. And because uh, Fabrengan came to that retreat, and that was, you know, we really got... And then we we tr then we we went back and talked about it on the re in our own retreat. I think the one at uh, Camp Tel Noah. And it was it was, and then we let in a lot of women into the chavara because we thought we had to let a lot of women in the chavara. And some of the women were you know, but it was I mean it wasn't such an easy process. I remember we let Alex Orr in, but she was you know the difference between Alex Orr and Art Green was like really big, you know they they weren't like some of the women that came in even though we wanted to have more women members, they weren't the, they weren't the, you know, study, they weren't studying, they weren't like being, you know, they weren't, they were being women. What do you mean by that? And they were like, they were, they were feminists and that was their agenda, they weren't, yeah, no, that's what I mean, they were, they were feminists. It, it turned out that that was they very important. They, they were feminists. They were feminists, oh yes, absolutely, feminists. Everybody was feminist. all, all the women were feminists. After 70, 71, every, all the women were feminists and most of the men were struggling to become more feminist. But we were still trying to preserve the neo-Hasidic aspects of it. We didn't call it neo-Hasidic, of course. We just called it Hasidic or whatever. Mystical. <laughs> Mystical. But we were doing it, you know. And, and not to put too fine a point on it, some of the texts, you know, of Nachman and the Besht and, you know, they were sexist. And forget about that. The Zohar is a deeply misogynist book, you know, with all of its God as the Shrina and woman, women, it has all these horrible anti-feminist sexist pieces to it. 
deeply, and yet we want to study the Zohar. So how did that make any sense? When do you remember there being discussion about the gendered language of traditional liturgy, just standard metaphors of kingship, etc.? Well, I remember in the we did a seminar on feminism, I think. I want to say Sharon Schumach did it, but I can't quite remember. It doesn't seem right to me. There were some people that were very much against it. Against what? Against feminization of the Chavara. They felt that once it started to go in that direction, that would be it. What does that mean, that would be it? It would, be, it would become a women's um, uh, movement collective, and it would stop being the Chavura. That would become the dominant issue. That would become the only issue that we, that we considered and that we would be able to address. It was a real fear. And the lesbian aspects of it also were a piece of that. We were challenged a little bit. In the early 70s? In the early 70s. The Ezra Nashim. I might have the chronology. I, Ezra Nashim was founded in sort of winter of 71, 72. And Benot Esh? Later, a little later. A little later. I feel it was the time of the Benot Esh. Feels right. You know, my friend Schiffer Bronsnick was part of that, and I keep on thinking she should be older than me because I remember her being young at the time, but it turns out that she's younger than me. So I, I know that I have some kind of... And Vanessa, uh, Vanessa Oakes, who was then Vanessa something else, she was part of that, she's my age. You know, this is a complicated thing for me to say, you know. It's just complicated, so. Number one, I was, I was not part of this whole kind of erotic, because I got myself married and I had uh, uh, consistent and persistent fidelity to monogamy. I believe in it, it's me, I'm never changing that, right? So that was what it was. It, this was not widely practiced. There were many other, other approaches to relationships and, those, and that was a, a factor. If the women's issue became the issue of the Chavura as opposed to the mystical issue, then we would become like a feminist, like a, on the vanguard of Jewish feminism. And we, we weren't cut out for that because we didn't have enough women involved and we just weren't cut out from it. And we thought we were making this other kind of, I think, this is my feeling about it, we were making this other kind of contribution and it was an important contribution and so that's it, you know. And we couldn't just say, oh, goodbye, you know, we're now going to be feminists as our calling card. We didn't want to do anything wrong, you know, about feminists. We weren't trying to to you know, squash anybody, but but I'm just trying to be honest and tell you that this is the the piece. Um, study was still very much in the center of it, and all of a sudden, the feminist critique came into the study. Study in the, was very much part of the uh, in the center of cover on life. Yes, it was. I think it was. Yes, the classes and people studying with each other. That's my experience of it. Shesh pesh. Study. We were still kids, but. Yes, study was very important. So you're saying if fe fe the feminist critique started to sort of become part of the focus of these... Yes, the conversation started to become more and more about feminism, you know, and, and that was probably right. You know, it was a time of, of you know, uh, reconsideration um, of lots of these things. But it was, there was some loss in it as well because we hadn't... Ex we, it hadn't just been an issue. I mean, I think what Green says is right. It was a pre-feminist moment, and it was lost in it as it became feminized. Right. And then... There was a freedom to yeah. doing it without those considerations earlier. And then when we left, it and became highly feminized. What? And a lack of self-consciousness. And a lack of self-consciousness, that's right. Well, it was a lack of self-consciousness about that. 
I said about that. For a very self-conscious group, it was a lack of self-consciousness, yes. Which is significant and interesting. Very. Yeah. Very. Mm -hmm. But you could say it about a number of other um, topics as well, but feminism the most, the most important. Mm -hmm. what, the else, what else do you think was sort of, uh, you know, maybe less, less of a focus, but falls yeah. within that kind of category? Gay, anti-Zionist. Um, anti-Zionist uh, or? Anti-Zionist. Anti-Zionist, yes. We, we, we just didn't, we, and, and communitarian. Um, the, the, yeah, there were a lot of anti-Zionists in the, in the group and political lefties, and we just didn't want to do that. Yes, so we marginalized those people. That's the fact. And some left. Some left. Eventually, I think all left. Yes, it was, and I don't know. It was during the time of the beginning of the settlements. You know, I signed uh, petitions at Brandeis against the settlements. You know, in 1970, 71. You know, like really early on settlements. You know, they were like shacks during the at the time. But we worried about that, and other people got really furious about doing about doing that. Got furious. Ruskies got furious at me for signing this thing. How could you be in this letter? You know. He doesn't even remember. But. Brera, which was founded in 73, right. was something that, for instance, uh, people in Febrengen, people in the New York Harbor Ra were, particularly New York Harbor Ra, were intimately involved in. Yeah, because Ruske, uh, Ruske started. Exactly. And there were others. He wasn't the only one, but right. he was central. And in ha the Harbor Ra, the Harbor Ra Shalom in Boston, were, was there significant interest in Brera or involvement with Brera? There was involvement, and I was one of the people involved. I'm, I was always more political then, and I'm more political now um, than a lot of the other people. Of the other people, but it was we were going to be Neil Hasidim. I want to keep on saying that because that's the fact of the matter. You know, we these were things that came up in Jewish life and that were crucial, and you know, but it wasn't that wasn't our countercultural moment. Our countercultural moment was post-denominationalism, learning as a way of expressing Judaism as opposed to davening and things like that. And the elevation of spirituality. And elevation of spirituality. That's what I was going to say next. So, and, and it wasn't going to be feminism. We weren't against it. We tried to accommodate it. It wasn't going to be politics. We were not, we were political. We, we wrung our hands and gnashed our teeth, but that was what it was going to be, you know? And so anything else that was distracting from that was, was, was distractions. It wasn't that it was bad, it was just distractions. And we all felt it was crucial. I'm sh I can remember having conversations that if any one of those aspects of uh, the agenda became the central part of the agenda, then the Chavara that we knew was over. Um, is there anything else you wanted to say about the, the role of learning um, within the Chavara? The role of learning was to meet each other. It was the best use of traditional text that I have ever experienced. It wasn't to learn and know more. It was to know each other. To know each other, to know oneself? To know each other and through that know oneself. But even, no, I want to stay with the original thing, it was to know each other. We would sit and learn People would prepare a lot. George Saverin taught, like, you know, Bible classes that he would prepare four and five hours for every hour that he would teach. But even so, in that group, in that circle, in the second floor, when we would sit around that table, we learned about each other. And that was transformative. And I think it, it has the best chance of being transformative to Jewish life in the future. We should stop being a shul based community, we should start being a learning-based community. And you can see it anyways, the Limud and uh, all sorts of other learning programs now are wildly more successful than, than shuls. And we were post-denominational, that was crucial. The Havara was post-denominational? Yeah. Why do you think that was crucial? Because, we, because Reform, Conservative, Orthodox, it was just, they were answering 19th century questions. We were trying to answer 21st century questions. And what were the 21st century questions? What did Judaism need to revive itself? What did Judaism need to survive? 
What did Judaism need to build to bring more people into a pluralistic community? Um, uh, what should Judaism obviously do about issues of gender and issues of um, of um, being part of nationalism that way? Hence the 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 focus on knowing coming to know each other as opposed to simply knowing oneself. Knowing oneself. Right. Community is not possible if you're only focused on yourself. That's right. And community is critical. I think we we achieved community because we weren't focused only on ourselves. And not everybody. You know, there's some people that were focused on themselves. Mm-hmm. But a lot were not focused on themselves. A lot. More than you can imagine. Was it that they were not focused on themselves or that they there was an achievement of some kind of balance or equilibrium? Maybe. Maybe they're focused on more than just themselves. We were focused on ourselves. Everyone was focused on themselves a little bit, you know. Yeah, we're going to graduate it school and things about, like that. But it was also about one's own spiritual seeking, one's That's quest, right. one's own development, one's developing but, knowledge is also skills, That's right. all but, of that. Yeah, it wasn't develop it wasn't about developing skills per se. It was much more self but even more than that communal knowledge. Steph and Jim and Steve and Charles, they wanted and Terry, they only wanted to be on communal knowledge. Agapic knowledge. People like Jim Kugel who came in with very little knowledge though. You needed to one of the things that has been talked about as a characteristic of that the early members was a certain level of knowledge and expertise for most people. And if you didn't have that, you had to you had to catch up through tutoring, intensive, your own intensive involvement in learning. Yeah. To catch up to a certain basic level of, so that you could participate in, in the conversation, in the davening, in all the different aspects of communal life that we're talking about. So it presumed a certain level of knowledge, or it, or, or it called for well, a certain level of knowledge. Jim Kula mastered stuff like at a shocking rate, and he was very self-confident, and so I write in my little journal, you know, today Kugel became the teacher. You know, and Kugel, like, so the, I remember the first day of sitting with Kugel and, and, and he didn't know Hebrew, but he knew Old French. Not just French, but Old French. So we're reading the Rashi and he's translating the Old French, you know, he's making comments about it. It was dazzling. Yeah. Dazzling. He was dazzling. There's so much dazzling stuff at the Chavar you can't imagine. Dazzling. Rosenberg would write a poem for us, it was dazzling. Really, you know? Gershon Hundert would go back and find some document of some, that I was like unbelievable. Really, dazzling, it was dazzling, it was a dazzling time. Was there any sense of a, a curriculum or a basic skill set that you needed to know or to acquire? And that classes were therefore geared towards. No, no, the classes weren't geared towards them, but you could get them. People were more than willing to sit down and give them to you, but not a curriculum in that way. That's why the Chavarot Shalom Community Seminary idea was—I don't know—it didn't. I don't think it ever really. We were going to do it. You know, it was Almond's idea. You know, I think Green will tell you. Did, did you interview Green? They'll tell you it's going to be, you know, um, brother Michael and, you know, and sister Brendel and he was going to have us be like in a missionary, I, you know, all sorts of stuff. Yeah. That didn't happen. I, I think, I stand with my understanding of the learning there and I don't think it's romanticized. I, I can think of too many examples of going through it. I remember in the Shir Shirim Rabbah, not Shir Shirim Rabbah, Shir Shirim, um, uh, going through Azakim Abadavah, love is as strong as death is, and going, working on that sentence for, for week after week, and just so much. So that my whole experience of love and even of finality and mortality, it was just, and that wasn't based on a, my knowing the Mishnah, you know. I learned the Mishnah later on. I mean, it, you could do it. And by the way, you know, when, even the Dorton group, at one point, we, wouldn't, we didn't learn the Chabra anymore. And then we wanted to learn from a guy named Jerry Fogelman in uh, Brookline, you know, and he was going to teach us Gemara. And he wanted to teach us 
in a kind of a crusader way and it fell apart. In a what way? In a in a systematic ordered way. Ways. Yeah, ordered way. Crusader is the word I use. Yeah, ordered way. It fell apart. We were. This was not a way. This was not about acquiring knowledge. This was in acquiring about noetic knowledge. You know. So it was. It was more precious and different. Different. You want, you want to learn Mishnah? Go to Brandeis. To what extent, if at all, did people learn in sort of Chavrusa style, in Chavrusa? They did learn in in, in Chavrusa style. I did. You know, Layman and I were Chavrusas for years. Mm -hmm. um, but it was slightly larger communities that were more significant, and sometimes the whole. Yeah. Has that influenced you? You've you spent a great deal of your professional career teaching in mm -hmm. a variety of different settings. That's it. That's all I can do. I can't fill out forms. You can see that. <laughs> I learned that. <laughs> um, it's not like I don't know what to say, but. How did how did your experience at Chabad Shalom sort of inform your? Your pedagogy, yeah. your, your your ways of teaching and learning. Yeah, your I, thoughts about learning. I can. Uh, I'm I'm pretty clear about that. Um, uh, the problem with Jewish teaching and even Jewish learning in America is you do aleph bet, in other words, introductory classes too much, and you do it with the smartest people on the face of the earth. So you take Jane Guberman and who you know went to Harvard and. And University of Pennsylvania and has theories and and then you say I'd, I'd like to give you the Rashi on it's just it's just it just doesn't cut it you know so so I decided early on to teach at a very high level and learn as much as I could about other fields so I could teach people that know huge amounts of things at their level teach Judaism as as at the same level as they learn law and I, what or physics yeah. So I teach a group of scientists, you know, and, and I love teaching them, but I also learn science before I go and teach them. Because I, I need for the metaphors, I need it for the insights, I need to be part of that game so that I can, I, I can do it. That is my, that's, you know, I, you know, when Green used to give uh, Divrei Tower or anybody really, but Green's one comes to my head, on the Parsha, oh my God, we didn't know the Parshas were about that. And they were about that. So, so my, my pedagogic style is to teach, not just up, but I hope even in a kind of a soaring level. And, and that's the Chavara, right? It was serious. It was intricate. It was delicate. And therefore soaring. Soaring. Otherwise, oh, I don't want to hear the same story. So sorry, you know, even the Torah can get boring if you don't do something new with it. Mm -hmm. We just change the lens, you know. And like when I went to college and I learned from, from Buzzy, you know, um, about uh, J, E, P, and D and like that. All right, so it was, it was interesting. It was, I, I, I was fascinated, more than fascinating. He was a fantastic teacher. But then he, he'd come to the Chavra and he'd do this. He would, the same little section that he taught us of J, E, and P, and D, he was, he'd put it all together again in a radically different way. And, and it was just, my God, it was breathtaking. You couldn't stop thinking about it for a day. And that, that's what I try and do. I try and make every um, class an encounter that, that has the possibility of changing your life. You think that's more likely to happen in a group setting than in a Chavrusa style setting? I do, although Chavrusas are wonderful. I have lots of Chavrusas. Mm -hmm. But yes, of course it is. Of course. It's a three-body problem. A little more physics. Yeah. Two people attract each other, but three bodies are very hard to chart because the interactions are so much more complex. And these are ten, 10 body problems. Yes, of course it does. It, you would need to break the, you need to break into the next realm, you know, and it's very hard to do that, but you can. Yeah. Last night I, took, I taught Gluckel of Hamel, you know? I do. Gluckel is a wonderful book, right? Really amazing. Um, and I, I have to say, you know, just like the Chavara, you know, I got, I, I, we got going on it. You know, you could feel it. You could feel the, Velocity and the. Who are you teaching? I, I teach people on Central Park West. They're really wonderful, amazing people. I've been teaching for years. So 17 years I've been teaching. Same group. Mm -hmm. and so it's just, a group? It's a group, yeah. 
we know each other, we care about each other. Do you think that matters in learning? I think it, um, I think your real commitment to each other matters a tremendous amount. Because otherwise, you say anything because I won't see you again anyways. What difference does it make? Goodbye. Mm -hmm. But if you think you're going to know each other and you're going to fall in love, that matters a lot. I'm sorry that your kid didn't get into the Brockmuth Fellowship, but that was in some ways what the Brockmuth Fellowship was. We will fall in love with each other. We will become lifelong friends. All right. And guess what? They fell in love with each other. They became lifelong friends. I know. That's completely out of the cover It was cover for kids. I showed the proposal to Kugel okay. when I designed it, and he said, oh, I see that you're design redesigning your youth. And what about Wexner? <laughs> so Wexner, Wexner comes more from Bravender. Um, uh, it had a literacy component to it, but the interaction among the members, I still think, because of the, in the hands of good teachers, shone through. So we really did get to know each other and build lifelong communities. But it wasn't the purpose of it. It was a... And Herb didn't always think it was good, even. Herb sometimes would yell at me. He says, no, no, the classes are too interesting. They're not learning enough. <laughs> what did he mean by that? He said, he said I go to your classes sometimes, and they're, they're, they're too passionate. They're, they're people are, you know, they're, everybody's, you know, everybody's engaged and things like that. I need people to actually learn the material so that when these... Events happen in our future, they'll know how to deal with them. I said, really? Really hurt? You know. But in the long run, most of the teachers that Wexner hires are more like me and less like him. Yeah. In your interview with Bill Novak that was published in Karen, uh, you said that before your involvement in the Chavarad, there had never been a link between your Judaism and your social activism. How do you think your involvement with the Havara sort of affected your perception of that relationship between Jewishness, Judaism, and social advocacy, social activism, what we now call tikkun olam? I actually think the Havara invented the phrase tikkun olam. I think it comes from Arthur Roscoe in 1973. So, a little... Say some more about that. Um, uh, Michael Stanislavski uh, did a little study of the tracking the phrase tikkun olam. You know, if you had said to me in 1970 or 71, well, here's the number of phrases. Which one do you think will make it in the Jewish community? I do not think I would have read tikkun olam, which is a mystical understanding of collecting the nitzot sot. And I mean, really, really, that's going to be like that. You know. Obama stands in front of the Jewish community and says, you know, I believe in tikkun olam, really? Does he have any idea? Um, you know, it's just, it's just crazy, but there it was, you know. So then, so that did have an enormous impact. You know, on the walls of the UJA right now is, you know, our commitments are to tikkun olam. Where, where did Arthur use it, Arthur Wasco? He used it in a series of speeches and then an article, and it just kind of took off. That he was the real, I, I think it came from the Freedom Seder. Mm. You know, if I'm not mistaken, but I don't really, I don't really know the yeah. answer. You can John find out. John Krasner has a, a, a very um, in-depth article on, on the history of the use of tikkun olam. He would say it was a little later, 87. 87? I don't think so late. No, he's not saying it's the first use, but it's when it became sort of a thing. Yeah. Uh, widespread. Everybody used it. it yes. A real touchstone. I'm not talking about that moment. I think that is probably 87. What I'm talking about is when it stops being a mystical term, the Taikain Olam in Malchut Shaddai, from the Alenu, it turns also into Tikkun Olam before it becomes Tikkun Olam. Yeah. You know, when, when, when it's used for social action and for the repair of the world by social um, right. motivation, this is, well, I mean, we're not far anyways off from each other, right? right. We're, we're on the same, basically the same page. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure it's Arthur that did it. And I'm, I'm, I revere him for that. So, so for you, when you look yeah, at Yeah, so then I also, I bought into it to a certain degree. I've, you know, but I didn't really buy into Tikkun Olam in that way. I can't say that. I, I, you know, when I go to the demonstration on the refugees, things like that, yes, I'm doing that of a Jewish motivation. I have become a Jewish cosmopolitan. I've become a Jewish cosmopolitan with goods, solid, 
um, uh, progressive uh, credentials. And even at my work in the UJA, which some people think is establishment, but I believe it's actually a shockingly progressive You're organization. You're a scholar in residence at UJA? I'm a scholar in residence at UJA because Mazon is a lovely food program for small amounts of people and advocating for the hungry. I, UJA feeds tens of thousands of people per day. You know, like if you really want to do the progressive agenda and you want to get it done, then as opposed to think about it and you know advocate for it, send us some money and uh, we'll, we'll help you. I mean, it's a, it's. I find I I feel uh, I feel it's a privilege to work for UJ all these years. Also, be a privilege to retire. Um, uh, um, having said that, I think a lot of the motivation comes out of Jewish texts, including Avat. Um, Abba Tisra. So I, it is a lens in which I see the world, Abba Tisra, and I am not going to let go of that lens. So even though I have some sympathy with BDS and I have some sympathy with, with uh, you know, JVP, the Jewish Voices for Peace, things like that, I, I'm, I'm an Abba Tisra guy. Love Jews, love the Jewish people. How does that connect? Because my, my social action comes, I'm just answering your question, yes. my social action comes out of my Jewish values. And I'm not able or willing to take some of my Jewish values and take them out so that I could just have progressive values. This is just progressive values. When I was a, a rabbi in central New Hampshire in Vermont, there was this guy that would come to the classes that I gave named uh, Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders, he's gone on. He was then running for uh, mayor of Burlington. And he just ran for... And he ran for president. Yes. And, and I voted for him. Because I support him. But we studied a text by... Um, uh, it's called The Non-Jewish Jew by Isaac Deutscher. Um, in which he basically claims these are progressive values. These are Russian Revolution progressive values, and they have nothing to do with Judaism. Judaism is a is a recalcitrant and uh, and uh, you know reactionary tradition. So uh, you know it's not a stupid argument. I reject it. I still think of Shabbos as a general strike. <laughs> I still think of anti-slavery, anti-genocide issues. I I feel motivated by my Jewish values. Including Avatian. And yet, uh, within Harach alone, in those early years, some of the most, the strongest criticism, critiques that were leveled at it, even by members like Bill, no doubt, yeah, right. were that people, members were not committed enough to social activism. Yes. And uh, some people actually left Havara over these issues. How do you see that now? When you both when you look back on how much alone, but also on Jewish life today? Yeah, of course he was right. He was right. We weren't committed enough to it. We were and we weren't committed enough to Israel. And we weren't committed enough to Israel when Israel was in trouble. Because in seventy three Israel was really in trouble. And we didn't send money when we needed to send money, when we only gave tea and sympathy. All these things are correct. I learned from those things, you know. When I was at Columbia I, I think I was still guilty of some of those things. At the UJA, I'm not guilty of those things. So at the UJA, I've been able to both be a good Heverman, a good citizen in the Jewish world, and I think do a lot of progressive uh, uh, politics and raise money for things that nobody else can really seem to easily raise money for. So mm -hmm. I, it has a lot of compromise. It means I sit in a lot of living rooms and kitchens of people that made their money in objectionable ways, but at least I get them to give some to us. And use them for the, these classes. Yeah. All right. You know, I, it's not perfect. I, I, don't, I have no messianic um, uh, images of... Sort of utopian images. Or utopian of all this all will come out. There's a lot of compromises. Mm -hmm. You know? But I believe in it. It's, it was almost a universal experience. Within Chavara Shalom, within the New York Chavara, even in Fabregen, which started out as an outgrowth of Jews for Urban Justice. Yes. That... The social activism, the collective social activism as a key leg 
of the, the edifice fell away. Yeah. People continued their social activism, even social activism as Jews, but more through organizations that were specifically geared to that, whatever the cause was, whether it was Zionism in Israel, anti-Zionism, uh, any other kind of anti-war, all kinds of things. Do you think, looking back on it, that it would have been possible to for Chavarot Shalom or any of the early Chavarot, any Chavarot in general, to have social that kind of social activism as a mainstay of its uh, in its in its scheme of priorities and in its the directions of its the work that people were doing. No. Okay, why? I think more about the kibbutz than I think about the Chavra or the Fabrengen or the New Chavra, um, because the kibbutz was social action personified. You know, we're gonna we're gonna create the new Jew. We're gonna create the beautiful socialist society and things like that. And the intensity of the interpersonal experience became um, paramount and the social action became less so. It could be because of the um, intoxicating nature of interpersonal experience when it works well in community. So you just don't want to do anything else, you know? Um, or it could just be that social action on, on, on a real scale needs a lot of money and fundraising and meetings and things. And we were consensus organizations by the nature of, our, of who we were. And, and consensus organizations simply can't, they can't produce a social action movement because too much, too much interior tension, not enough money, too, it exposes too many um, inequalities in the system. You know, UJ is a good social action system because we get really rich people to pay for really poor people. Okay, that's good. But the poor people don't meet the rich people. They're not like supposed to become friends. The rich people are supposed to give a lot of money so that the poor people can eat and, and prosper and do all the kind of things that they want to do. If you build a community, then the people that are making a lot of money and the people that aren't making a lot of money get pissed off at each other. Exactly. And there's seems like there is an issue in the consensus model, which all of the Chavarot had the early Chavarot. That's right, all of us. That sort of precluded the possibility of always being on the same page right. about p different political issues. Israel, poor, right. All, all of those. All. So just because you are you can get a tremendous amount of spiritual uh, fulfillment through davening and that aspect of one's life doesn't mean that you're all going to be on the same page. And you weren't in right. terms we of weren't. these other issues. That's right. Also, you know, these things are these things are you know moments in time. So, you know, once I got married and started having children and needing a job and things like that, I couldn't do all that stuff anymore. You know, I needed to go home. Which was true of everybody. It's Maybe true of everybody. One of the main critiques of the critiques, in the sense of a commentary, yeah. of the early Chabura was that it was only possible because, with very few exceptions. People were single or newly married. They didn't have children. They didn't have jobs right. that they were responsible for. They could focus. It was a time in their lives when they could focus precisely on this. Live in a little apartment, you know, with a crappy shower, you know. I was 22. It didn't matter. <laughs> right. You know, but now it does matter. It does, you know. I'm just, maybe for good or for ill, it matters. Right. Right. And my children would be so disappointed if I couldn't have sent them to college. <laughs> you know, so... You know, I think that's okay. I, you know, I, I want the next generation. I want it to be a, 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 a parade, not a, not a marathon. So I don't have to run the entire distance myself. I want each generation to come in successive waves and, and, and get this done. And, and every once in a while, they'll age out, you know. My, my daughter is a very socially active person. I hope she's going to soon become less socially active so I can have grandchildren. So please watch this video. <laughs> <laughs> Let her know if you see her. I'll give you her picture. All right, so let's, let's try and bring some of all of this together. So we've been um, talking mainly about, this, or mainly about this early period, 68 to 73. You were actually involved from... 69 to 73. 69 to 74. When you 74, yes, when you graduated, 74. And then went off to... 
Philadelphia. To Philadelphia. So you left to go to rabbinical school. Um, but ultimately, you weren't ordained at RRC. Can you just tell us briefly what path you took and why? <laughs> <laughs> briefly. Um, well, yes, I'm the first Chavura ordained uh, rabbi. Um, uh, I'm just sure that that's true. I got ordained at a Chavura national conference and I got ordained by Chavura members. So, what could be more than that? Um, uh, after the level and intensity of study of the Chavura, um, as well as the lack of papers and uh, evaluation uh, um, uh, devices, let's say that, um, uh, but not entirely that, um, uh, I just decided to do it myself, you know? Um, and I was going to decide to become a rabbi under my own terms, as opposed to JTS or RRC or YU or anybody else. So you left RRC close to the end. I did. No. Yeah, really close to the end, yeah. Close to the end doesn't even capture how close to the end it was. Um, I decided I didn't want RRC. I think I left in January of the last year that they were going to make me go to RRC. Maybe saying that they were going to make me go to RRC gives you a little hint of my disdain for it at that moment. Not that those people are good people. I'm kind of friends with some of them still, you know. Sid Schwartz was in my class. He's a good guy. Terp Tobin's a good guy. You know, but I, I didn't want to be a Reconstructionist rabbi. And I didn't want to be an Orthodox rabbi because I'm not Orthodox. And I didn't want to be conservative. I'm not, certainly not conservative. And Reform I didn't even know very much about. So I wanted to be a pluralistic, post-denominational rabbi um, for small, intense communities. And so that is what I became. And how did you um, do that? Uh, I studied with Zalman, I studied with Alan Lehman, I studied with Norbert Samuelson, Reform Norbert, and conservative slash reconstructionist uh, Alan, and orthodox slash renewal Zalman. Oh, um, and Brabant are orthodox, um, and, and Sayyid Hossein Nasser Muslim. Um, and all of those people came to my smicha. So um, in 1981, two? 81. One. Um, uh, well, in, Zalman in 81. Yeah, Zalman in 81. So, so I had already taken a Bechina for the Rabbanut, you know, and I had done well enough at it so that I could have been a, what's called a Rav Manhig, which is enough. You know, you can then come back to America and call yourself a rabbi. You take it at, at, at uh, you, you take it from the Rabbanut. You take it from the, from the rabbinic, from the rabbinate. But, you, but, because I studied Brabbanus. So, and, but I didn't want to do that. I wanted to be the student of Zalman, and I wanted to be the, I wanted to be a pluralistic person. I wanted to be a Jew for a rabbi for the Jewish community, and so I became um, Zalman's second musmach. But the first musmach, Danny Siegel, was his Talmud, his acolyte, his you know disciple. I'm not Zalman's disciple. Zalman is one of my great teachers, but I did not intend to become Zalman. David Ingber, maybe, you know, he wants to continue the Zalman legacy. Most of the renewal people that I know of, some of whom are extraordinarily talented, want to become Zalman disciples. Our Zalman disciples want to further his work. I don't. I want to further the work of the pluralistic Jewish community. So I only worked in pluralistic programs. Rothman and Dorot and Hillel and uh, Wexner and, and, and Limud FSU and all these things. They're all... They're all pluralistic programs, and I want, to re, I want to turn the Jewish community towards study, because study is a, is a unifying uh, activity, and it should be serious, transformative, elevating study. So that is what I did. So at my smicha, I got Zalman and Alan and Bravender and um, Norbert and Sayyid Hossein Nasser to come in front of all these people and ask me questions. This was at a Chavara retreat? A Chavara retreat, Chavara National Conference. conference. It's not called a retreat, it's called a... The Summer Institute? Summer yes. Institute, yes. Mm -hmm. um, in Hartford, Connecticut. And for three hours they asked me questions. Just in front of about 150, 200 people. I just tried to answer as many as I could. I mean, Alan at one point looked at me and said, can you recite a Gemara and teach it to us? You know, from where I said, oh, I don't know. And he said, well, try. So I said, then I did, you know. It was, a, 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 it was an unparalleled experience. And there's a phrase in my smicha that says, 
um, a year at Cheto Kodem at Chachmato. Um, uh, we are sure. Um, uh, we're sure that his fear of sin will take precedence over his own wisdom. And I, 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 I appreciate that line. What does that mean to you? What it means to me is that it's not about me. It's not about my own view. It's not about the conservative Jewish view or the reformed Jewish view. My, I'm, I'm afraid of sin. I'm afraid of going off the derech. And so I'm trying to bring everybody together on, on a derech. That's what I thought the Chavra was really about. And derech. Uh, However defined. Else. However defined, yes. I mean, right now they say, you know, he's off the derech means that he's not Haredi anymore. But... That's not what you mean, clearly. It's not what I mean, but it's kind of what I mean. I, there's, forget about the Haredi part, but there is a Jewish way, and I want to be part of the Jewish way. And so I, I have been. I think I really have been. I think I've been... I think I'm a, a true product of the Chavra in that way. As, much, as true as anybody that I think you have spoken to. I don't think I've sold out about it. I don't think I've... What do you see in your path as being really a product of the Chavara and, and, and keeping faith with whatever the Chavara symbolized, its, whatever its vision was, whatever its reality was? Pluralism, community, learning, social action, social responsibility, love. Is there a place in there for spiritual something? Spiritual, spiritual... I, I do think so, but not... Fila. Yeah. Well, no. No. Okay. That's my search. My, my encounter with God. Tefillah is my encounter with God. But I'm not going to design a community which is going to exclude the wide majority of people because they can't get into prayer. It's a highly poetic, subtle, complex, and, uh, and, and um, exquisite experience, which I'm f- highly committed to. And I do it a lot, you know? If I think about the hours in my life that I spent in, in tefillah, it would be enormous numbers of them. I'm not going to exclude a wide population of Jews from those from things I said. I think if I talk about pluralistic and educational and socially active and socially responsible, I can, everybody should be able to do that. Everyone. And that's what I want. And on, in that, I want to have my own prayer life and my own spiritual search, which I have been persistent at. But I don't, I don't do that. I, I teach tefillah, but I don't mostly lead tefillah. But I do teach it. It's a wonderful intellectual liturgical exercise. So many of the people who were originally involved in Chavarat Shalom, including art, for sure, saw themselves as spiritual seekers. Right. It was at the heart of what the Chavara experience was for them in many ways, and certainly for Chavarat Shalom in particular, in comparison to both Ferengen and the New York Chavara. Well, I am sorry that art didn't build a movement. Zalman tried to build a movement. Art didn't build a movement. So we are a relic. Um, uh, it is a wonderful relic. I feel honored to have been part of it. I feel thrilled. I feel it's divine providence that I was part of it. But he didn't build a movement, you know? You know someone in this very room said that they like Musser. But Musser is a little group, and Hasidus is a big group. So what you can say about Musser is that it didn't really build a movement, you know? Some people talk about the Chavara movement. Do you think there's a Chavara movement? No, I don't. Not really. I think there's a series of Chavara ideas, and I believe in them, and I love them. What are the critical ones? Learning. Yeah, learning. Post-denominationalism, pluralism, sense of community, social responsibility, social activism. Within a Jewish frame, something. Whatever. Within the a Jewish, other. within a Jewish narrative, I would I would use the phrase Jewish narrative to it. Okay, can you just talk about that for a minute? Why? Because I think that we are part of a long story, um, and we have lots of literary creations: Torah, Mishnah, Gemara, Kos, Achronim, Rishonim, Achronim, Midrash, um, uh, which are curriculum for for who we are. And if you learn those stories in the narrative, so the stories and narrative. Um, it will teach you certain things. Um, 
And those things are not well, well um, uh, replicated in the rest of society. We want people to prosper, even with money. Most religions are poverty oriented. We want people to have um, universal intellect. Most people don't do that. I'm saying what's in the article now. You know, um, but I believe in those things. We are global citizens. Most people are more and more xenophobic um, and, and turn inward. Most people, we, we are a big Baal Tzedakah. We, we believe in generosity to each other. And most people do not believe in generosity and don't practice generosity. So these are, now everybody has the little pieces of those. We keep them in balance. Anytime you go out of balance on those things, then the whole narrative structure falls apart. I think that these are the narrative structures that the Chavara has tried to prosper as, a, as opposed to some other things, you know? And if we build big edifices so we can all sit in shul together, I, I think that was, a, that was a dead end. I think that was a mistake. I really do. You know, the UJA right now is trying to prop up synagogues um, and make them uh, exciting and dynamic institutions again. I, I'm hoping that they go the way of other Jewish institutions and new institutions come. I don't believe in those institutions. I like little minyanim. Do you see the, the independent minyanim of today as in the legacy, shall we say, of, of the early couple of roads? I do, in, including the partnership minyanim, you know, like the Orthodox partnership ones. I, I do see them that way. That they don't, though. They don't. Can no. you say what that is? Uh, the partnership ones. These are um, these are from egalitarian um, uh, minyanim, mechitza, but women lead the davening and give the great Torah and lane. So so I, I, that's very attractive to me. If I if my friends didn't go to minyanim, so I could hang out with them, at least and sing and drink once a week, I would go to a partnership minyan. It would be a very amenable thing for me to do. The minyan at uh, at uh, in Israel. A lot of the minyanim in Israel like the Hartman Minion, which is called something else. You know, not Dr. Noam, but I can't remember what it's called right now, but those things. The um, Shlomo, Leader. Leader Minion. Shlomo has been great um, at giving a musical voice to something enthusiastic and davening, all these things, are, I, I think. But these are all small, intense groups. The, the, the building of big prayer halls so everybody can pray this, I think, was a mistake. I'm a, I'm a minion guy. I'm, I've, and I, do you, so do you see that, that, that sort of notion of small, intense community as among the most critical sort of yes. pieces of the legacy I do. in which these other things that you've been talking about can thrive? High much. liability Judaism. You have to really engage yourself. You have something to give and something to lose. Mm-hmm. Whereas you go into a big synagogue, Nobody, no, nobody knows you. Nobody cares. There's not they don't care, but it just that's just not what they're about. So I'm not against them, but I don't think that they are the vehicle that will take us to the future. And the chavura was the, I think, one of the sparks of the turn towards these vehicles, at least in the non-orthodox world. And the non-orthodox world taking lessons from the orthodox world very early on because Zaman and Art and a few other people could actually read Orthodox texts, is not only significant, but transformative. Maybe even salvific. So, as you look, as we're here we are, we're almost 50 years after the founding of the first Chavara, and we're at this well, point pretty well into the 21st century. When you look around at the, the challenges that the Jewish community is facing today, and the, we in the world are facing as part of, as part of the, the larger community, what do you see as the major contributions for, of, of the Chavara and, uh, and, its, and its lessons? Yeah, I, I just have a totally, I have a totally different one than, than comes out of the conversation that we have. And the, and the lesson that I think is totally different is that it gives secular Jews um, uh, a way about going about being Jewish small, intense communities of social action and social responsibility with Jewish narratives. This is what secular Jews can do. And most Jews are secular, you know? So I'm not so worried about the people that go into the reform or conservative movements, but they're shrinking, you know, rapidly shrinking, and they're not tooling at all, even though they want to. They're good people. They're well-meaning. They don't know how. I would not tell them to do it either for the, 20, for the middle of the 21st century. But these small communities of secular Jews, and you can see them in lots of places now, Moshe houses and, and you know, and Hill Next and by the base, 
I mean, all these things, you know, they're all kind of uh, um, uh, a reformulation of the Chavra, so that people who are, come from a secular Jewish perspective will know what to do, what, what, where to belong, what to, you know, uh, it's even the Jewish community centers, you know, right after you leave, the guy from Krakow is going to come and, he, and we're going to talk about a secular Jewish community of Krakow because the religious communities are boring they're not, and no one, can, no one can bear them. I don't know if rabbis are going to be the, the heads of the Jewish world and the, of the Jewish people in the next generation. I, I think that they won't be. But communal organizers and communal leaders, I think, will be. So that's, that's my thought about it. And I, I hope to go to Europe and, and form those kind of communities. Lay leaders are very important now. They didn't used to be so important. Now they're very important. That was a real departure from all the other things, but that's what I think. A lot, a lot to think about, a lot to think about. <laughs> As we sit in the beginning of the Trump era here. Yeah, I don't know if we can fix that. I mean, we can fix it, actually. I, just one comment about Trump. Um, I do a lot of study of what's called the Second Great Awakening. Um, uh, oh, the in, Second Great. The gr Second Great Awakening. Um, uh, it was the movement of the 1820s, which was counter to the Constitution and the founding fathers, who were a bunch of 17th century European rationalists. Um, and these were, the, these were the utopian, you know, um, off-print land. Right? Mormons and Millerites and Adventists, something like that. And then you can see it right after Wilson, also, in the Harding, Coolidge, Hoover period of time. And you can see it now, you know? There's a spirituality to that, and, and people feel it deeply. And fundamentalist Christianity is part of that. Can we, but every once in a while, you can flip it to a progressive one. Dorothy Day and people like that, they did that. Um, and the people that are called the post-millennial um, uh, dispensationalists. They, they, they said, we're going we're gonna to move ourselves forward based on a religious revival in the face of an of a Enlightenment philosophy. And if we take part in that conversation, we can help with that. Even the Chavra people, because we're religious people, we know about religious language. And I, and I want to, I, I do think that. Those are the people that voted for Trump. And I understand why they voted for Trump. You know, they voted for Trump out of religious motivation, whether it was worrying about abortion or anything, or, you know, or, or, or life or pro-life or things like that. Whatever misguided or, you know, things they were doing, that was, it, it has a religious motivation to it. And in the 1960s, at least this particular religious motivation that I was part of in the late 60s, early 70s, at least was a progressive religious motivation. And that is a thing to contribute. I hope we can contribute it. Final question for me. We're living in a time when there's increasing uh, awareness of diversity within our community. Racial diversity, interfaith marriages, uh, all kinds of diversity, economic diversity, a time when many Jews feel like they are back towards that more universalist impulse because, because we are living so closely in a, in a global community. And mm. how important is it, do you think, for Jews, secular Jews that you're talking about, to continue to uh, deal with what is coming in the world, in the world in which we live, from within this Jewish derech, this Jewish framework, as opposed to something that's more pluralistic in, yeah. in that larger sense. Yeah, I think about this a lot. Like, what would victory be for us? Yeah. Okay, we did good. We lasted 3,000 years. We had good values. We brought lots of Nobel Prize winners. Enough. Goodbye. <laughs> you know, like... Let's all intermarry and go back into the gene pool and see you later. You know, it's, and it's not a stupid idea. You know, um, uh, Shimon Rabinovich has the great article, "The Israel, the Ever Dying People," as a strategy for innovation. I kind of like the idea that many of us think that this is it—that we're in the last generation of Jews. It's a good strategy because if you're in the last generation, go for broke. You know, like it's it's a very good innovation strategy. Uh, and yet, but, that's not what your life's about. I still think that God needs us, Jews, in the world. It's a kind of an outrageous statement. 
Why? Because of Torah. Because I think... I have to say this in a shorter way. Um, in the, the book of Exodus, in chapter 19, there is our mission statement, which I believe is Am Segula, Goy Kadosh, and Mamlech HaKonim. So Am Segula, you know, is uh, we're the treasured people. So we have a lot of memory, because we're old, and we've been at it for a long time. And you should have a people that has an old, long memory, you know, and be assigned to everybody else, a Segula, you know. And then uh, Goy Kadosh, we should be a little distinctive, Separate it, little holy, you know, like something. Care about these things. But the real one for me is Mamlech HaKonim. We should be the conduit of blessing into the world. And I believe that we can be the conduit of blessing into the world. And the world has to know that it can permanently change. I'm optimistic. I'm extremely optimistic. I'm an optimistic person. And I'm optimistic now because I think the world can change. Because we are the Mamlech HaKonim, the kingdom of, of, of priests. And the kingdom of priests means that we have to be open to the blessing coming through us. We have to be careful that we don't burn up as the blessing comes through. And it's a precarious job. And I do think that the Chavra, just in the last kind of, I do think the Chavra tried to be Mamlech Kohanim. I do think it, you know, we, one of the first things the Chavra did, we, we don't, people don't talk about this, is we got rid of the Kohen Levi Yisroel uh, Aliot, right? We didn't do Kohen anymore because we were egalitarians. We, we not feminine, but everybody, you know? So he said, you know, just because your father's a Kohen doesn't mean you get to be a Kohen. You're not going to get the first Aliyah. You don't, and a lot of you don't even know what the first Aliyah is. You know, we're not doing that anymore. Right? We're all in this. We are the Mamlech Kohenim. That's what I feel. We are the Mamlech Kohenim. We need Hasidim. We need friars. We need Reformed Jews. We need secular Jews. We need Buddhists. We need JVP. We need nutheads. We need all these people, crazies. We need them all because we're the Mamlech Kohenim. That's what the Mamlech Kohenim does. And I think there's still blessing pouring itself into the world. The overflowing nomos of God is still pouring God into the world. You know, I'm still a religious guy. You know, I'm, uh, even though I said the other stuff, I myself, I'm, honest, I'm a religious guy. And I feel that. I feel it all the time, even right now, that, the, that God is pouring God's self into the world. And I want to make sure that there's a conduit to bring that blessing into the world. I think that's us. It's worth the effort. And also, get nice apartments. So, you know, that's it. That is a great way to end. Thank, Thank you, you so much. It's Thank you. Wonderful.